The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is the Four Center podcast feed, and this particular episode is the Kenobi Report. This is Kenobi Report, episode three, about part four, also known as a celebration of the life and times of Tara Sanube. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. Uh, oh, man, I had people texting me one in the morning, <laughs> my time, which was a lot of di- different time zones, reaching out going, please, how is Joseph? How is Joseph? I was like, well, I don't live with Joseph. We, we occasionally travel and go to conventions <laughs> together, but don't live with him. I, I assume he's okay. Assume he's okay. But yes. uh, I received many uh, nice messages uh, from uh, wonderful Star Wars friends uh, and also uh, our friend Alex Damon of Star Wars Explained, a uh, very kindly featured a shout out to my perhaps hurt feelings my sensitive emotional state and received many more nice tweets so thank you all for that Mm. if you're just tuning in and you're like what are you talking about uh we will talk about it in more depth but the the great jedi master the kosian jedi master uh heavily featured in the Clone Wars animated episode, animated series episode, Lightsaber Lost, Tara Sanube was indeed uh, confirmed <laughs> to be no longer alive, at least. I mean, th- I mean, sure, he's in a tomb. <laughs> His eyes are open and he's displayed as a trophy, but he could still live, right, Ken? He's napping. He's napping. It's a hibernation. The hibernation sickness will wear off, right? That's, that's what it's got to be. All of those Jedi in there. Yeah, yeah, we will talk about it in great depth, but this is not the Terra Sanube report. Maybe that's something mm. that we will start when there's some more Terra Sanube content. And honestly, seeing him just made me excited for the possibility of even more Terra Sanube content in the future. Got to see him in live action, just not yeah. alive. <laughs> anyway, we're going to dive into this. Ken, how are you feeling? I'm feeling great, man. I'm feeling great. We're going to talk about a lot of things in this episode. There's some stuff, uh, you know, uh, we, I don't want to even say work through. I just, uh, you know, want to acknowledge some of the, I, I watched this and was like, oh, okay. I have to engage with that. I have to see. And other things, I was just like, this is amazing, including this episode. What I'm just calling this a dry run for a new hope. It is the Death Star escape <laughs> in a different time. And there's so much to learn. I really love that. And because the episode was a little shorter, by the time you and I have, uh, you know, sat down to press record here, I've watched this episode four times. I think you have as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Yay for early alarm clocks on the West Coast. And I each time love more and more that this is like, let's look at New Hope. Let's look at Escape and let's go back to see where some of the foundations come from. Man, I am really loving that. Yeah, that, well, that's really, really great to hear. And I can't wait to uh, dive into uh, all those ideas. Uh, yeah, I watched it. It was uh, shorter, which was definitely uh, the, my first reaction was, oh. <laughs> and my second was, well, I can just watch it again, uh, which I did immediately yeah. last night. And then again mm-hmm. uh, this morning, uh, part four was uh, 38 minutes with credits, but a little bit closer to like 32, 34 of actual content uh, written by Joby Harold and Hannah Friedman. Those are the only credits uh we've been uh tracking this mm-hmm. uh two of the other writers who are uh, sometimes uh credited either with uh teleplay or with uh story by uh Stuart Vitti and uh Hossein Amini are uh, people who have been involved in earlier iterations of what this uh what this story is so I thought it was really interesting to see that this episode was credited just to people who were involved in the final crafting of this story which really spoke to uh, this part of the story being either being uh, a part of the latest, uh, the final crafting of the story. Mm-hmm. Did you have any reactions to that? Um, it's been it's been fun to track. We keep talking about it each week, and I think it's important with this series because it went through so many iterations. So I've been fascinated with it. But at the end of the day, I just uh, I, I love that we're getting this uh, this one vision from from Deborah Chow. And, and and we keep saying all roads uh, lead to Deborah Chow, but it, it's, it's it's just been fun. And 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 I um you know I know Joby Harold's been out and about on the talk circuit, which is sometimes <laughs> not our favorite thing around here. I love it. I always love good insights from writers about the process, but it's a weird time, and that can be used against him. That could be misinterpreted. There could be just absolute lies told based on what the people think is in the interview or want to think is in the interview. So it's been an interesting journey. But really happy what we're uh, we're getting from these this team. 
Yeah, I, I agree. And I'm very intrigued to, to hear what uh, writers have to say and what, hear what Joby Harold has to say. I personally haven't uh, clicked on any of the links yet because I think uh, where I come from is I just want to engage with the story. I want to engage with the text. And that can be uh, a frustration we've mentioned on the podcast before. But if you're newer, it, it can be frustrating for me when I want to have a conversation <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. with fellow fans about the text, about the story and you realize that people aren't even, you know, debating about the text. They're just quoting, you know, interviews mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, with creators back and forth, which have value. But I want to engage with the story first. And, and then I'll engage with the writer's thoughts, particularly when the story isn't even over yet. Yeah. And you have to be careful. It could be Tony Gilroy going, all right, here's my outlines. Uh, you want to see my outlines? Here's what's going on. Here's what's going to There's season two, episode uh, nine. Uh, <laughs> And in frame 35 of episode <laughs> seven, when Cassian blinks, it means yeah. this. Yeah, I, I, I don't want that. I want the I want the story. Um, yeah, but it, of course, all of it is you're saying is being guided by Deborah Chow, directed once again by Deborah Chow. It is really fun uh, to see uh, not only what she's bringing out of the actors, bringing out of the moments, but kind of a repeated camera angles and shots. I really like that there are a lot of kind of overhead shots there's so much in this uh show that is sort of uh, about the the dark side's perspective of who gets to dominate and uh, a lot of our our characters being in fear and lots of overhead shots of shadows (laughs) crossing over and a lot of great uh sort of uh, directorial touches that it's really great to to spend this much time with one director and really see those things uh come to the surface yeah indeed so we like to always set the scene of our own viewing experience. Uh, I set up as normal Ken at midnight. Every once in a while, the show pops on at eleven fifty-eight. So I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting yeah. anxious. Uh, I just opened a new Kenobi figure, uh, the Vintage Collection three and three quarter Attack of the Clones Kenobi, uh, with similar hairstyle to this Kenobi. Not right. exactly the same, similar. Uh, so that Kenobi figure got to watch with my other classic. Poured myself uh, some gin and. Uh, also, the other weird thing about watching this time is this is the first time uh, that a Marvel show and a Star Wars show drop on the same day time. Mm, mm, so that was right. I, I was obviously all there for Kenobi and I'm waited for uh, Ms. Marvel and I can't wait to watch that one. Uh, I, I do always try to contain my noises. Uh, so I don't wake my wife. Uh, and um, I believe my Terrace Anubi noise did wake my wife. <laughs> yeah. I did. I did literally scream no. Uh, yeah. And then quietly, yes. Uh, which, again, we'll talk about. Uh, what was your uh, adventure for sitting down to watch Kenobi this week? A uh, busy day yesterday. But by the time, uh, you know, 10 o'clock our time uh, settled down, it was uh, Grace uh, on the couch uh, watching. She loves Ozark. She's she's in a big uh, binge of Ozark. And I'm on my side uh, playing uh, MLB show. Um, MLB the show on my PlayStation 4 because I can't upgrade to the 5 yet. And just so there was a lot of tension. Because Ozark's a pretty tense show. I only hear it, but it sounds pretty tense. A lot of, <laughs> lot of deals going wrong. And then on my side, my MLB The Show, uh, I'm heading towards the playoffs, and my right fielder fractured his arm, and it's past the trading deadline, and I don't know how to replace him. So there was a lot of tension. And then it was like 11.55, and I was like, it's the Kenobi show time. We, let's, let's stop what we're doing. Let's relax, and let's watch Kenobi. So it was a welcome uh, relief to uh, watch Kenobi. Then an episode full of, immense tension (laughs) yeah so in the middle of drug deals gone bad and broken video game bones you sat down for some (laughs) nice relaxing kenobi Mm -hmm. let's launch into trauma (laughs) yeah this wasn't the uh old man working at the meat shop in the in the desert episode this was uh (laughs) tension and and and, uh, danger around every corner Exactly, exactly. All right, well, let's get into our overall reactions. Uh, You already said some great stuff about the uh, New Hope connections, but what was your overall reaction? Love it, like it, struggle with it, a mixture? Yeah, no, I really actually think um, it's weird. The first viewing, we always say, you know, the first viewing, you're going to have some uh, different thoughts. And there was some stuff we'll talk about uh, how it looked and and how little beats weren't maybe my favorite at first and how it was almost like the return of Mando season one, Ken, where he just keeps pointing at the screen and going, I I understand that's a VFX shot and therefore it's uh, taken me out of the story. I'm not in that spot anymore, but there were some things in there. So, you know, you kind of process that stuff on the first viewing and then go back to find what's there in the story and there is so much there i keep saying i'll say it again this dry run from a new hope i mean i just put down a list of 
reminders, you know, from, from I'm on a diplomatic mission to Alderaan to her resistance to the mind probe is considerable. All these mm-hmm. classic New Hope, New Hope beats and to see them not just replayed, but to see them um, put up on the screen for you to analyze uh, where they are as characters right now and what and will uh, where they will go and what they will become. I, really, really powerful. And, and I really love that. And just as a Star Wars fan. Uh, back from back in the day and I don't you know whenever you started is your back in the day whether it's two years ago or 20 years ago or 40 for us um, I just love that kind of stuff it is that poetry we, we, we always talk about yes and that can be you can make fun of that you can have a snarky meme about that or you can engage with what that means and the rhythms and the, and the poetry and, and, and some of the repeating beats but also the different kind of beats man I was really into that and that concept for the episode that's really great. And I look forward to discussing that in terms of themes, but also just in terms of like the canning, because it really was. There's so many interesting little beats uh, that were connected in particular to A New Hope. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think my general journey was the same. I really enjoyed this episode. Uh, I think I had to practice what we preach here on Four Center, which is to, uh, you know, confronting expectations is the destiny of a Star Wars fan, like confronting fear is the destiny of a Jedi. Yep. I think I had some kind of um, some hopes, uh, in particular when it comes to Reva. Uh, I loved every bit and every beat of uh, what was going on between Reva and Leia, but I think you and I had really discussed last week, like, is Reva going to have any sort of crisis of conscience as she is faced with uh, torturing Leia? Is this confrontation with Leia going to reveal a little bit more of her backstory or is it going to uh, push Reva into kind of na- making her next choice, right? Because I believe Reva is going to have an arc on this show. Mm-hmm. Um, but so then I was confronted with an episode where I feel like she did have uh, bits of, of doubt uh, bits of, uh, you know, really changing up her tune to <laughs> stay yeah. in favor of Vader. There's a lot going on with her and seeds were planted, but I went into it with this kind of hope for her to make this next big choice or mm-hmm. to have more about her backstory really cemented. And this was a great opportunity for me to exercise what we talk about and say, okay, you had those hopes and expectations. They might still be coming in other episodes. They might mm-hmm. not but put those aside and engage with what is there. Mm. So that's, mm. that's a little bit what, what I went through. Uh, and then engaging with what was there was really worthwhile. <laughs> yeah. The stuff that I really, really loved is just that to me, the, the beating heart of this episode is Kenobi reawakening. It, it is, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Leia and, and Reva are, are it's absolute center main characters tall as well. Uh, but the journey we're going through, the perspective we're being carried through is, is Obi-Wan's journey back to hope and this was yeah. such a great reawakening and it made for great emotional beats and great action beats uh now we can start to you know divide the episodes by what kind of trial has obi-wan gone through you know he's mm-hmm. gone through a a trial by depression <laughs> yeah you know a trial by fire a trial by water now um it, so that that was probably like my my favorite thing Obviously, the New Hope stuff was great. It was also such a, a an episode uh, just uh, that really resonates if you have played Jedi Fallen Order, you know, in in, yeah. in that surreal space to to be in a, a world and an environment that you as the viewer, if you've played that video game, have a more intimate relationship than Obi-Wan Kenobi does. You know, that's mm-hmm. so weird to be able to want to like raise your hand and go like, oh, Obi-Wan, would you like any pointers from me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the audience on how to navigate uh, Fortress Inquisitorius. Yeah, th- this episode was really one part Clone Wars and two parts level on a video game. It really was. Uh, and down to when he was, you know, the, the the holding the water back was like, can you press down that X button long enough to get that <laughs> little, uh, you know, power meter up to the top where the miss that beat is complete in the game. Uh, so, yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, final big picture thing that I really wanted to mention is I really loved how much the idea of the Jedi uh, was centered in this, obviously, yeah. it's becoming the the plot that one of the things to be defended is the path, is uh, mm-hmm. this network that protects uh, Jedi and for sensitive people in general, for sensitive loved ones, uh, a lost wife is mentioned, but also children in particular. But within all of that, this episode really shifted the show to be about like, it, it's not just, this is something that Obi-Wan passed through. This is some people who kind of helped Obi-Wan out. You're like, if mm-hmm. he didn't go to Jabim and he just went off to another planet, you know, that would be a different show. 
this yeah. episode centered the question of is it worth protecting Jedi and why mm -hmm. and what does it mean to be a Jedi? And when I let go of, of my expectations, that's what what I really absorbed on the second viewing and made me really love this episode. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait to dive into some of the bigger themes there. But to tag that, I, I, I don't know where exactly to place this in our conversation, so I'll drop it in here now. Forges Inquisitorius being this tomb was bonkers. It was evil, cruel, and I loved it. I loved it in the sense of what it shows, this dark side destroying and how it builds on pain. And we keep talking about unprocessed pain, a lot of trauma in this show. Literally, this episode being about, I don't know, we don't know what's in there. It's just this really, you know, really impressive imperial facility that we shouldn't try to go and we don't know what's down below no one does and then when you get down to see what's at the core of it all this pure mm -hmm. evil and it's jedi it's the light of the galaxy um snuffed out and i agree with you uh just even the talk of the path and what it means yeah uh, i love that focus love that focus. yeah yeah mm -hmm. and i think it's it's uh, gonna be a big thing going forward in in star wars lore the path um i lied when i said i had only one <laughs> thing left to say uh two, <laughs> two other big picture things i wanted to say is uh i admit on first reaction one of the things i was most thrilled about is there's a third obi-wan outfit that i'm going to be able to buy action figures of already <laughs> third and arguably fourth uh we'll talk about and then also uh yeah. the con the continuation of this uh obi-wan kenobi television show having a little bit of a spirit of the cliffhanger it, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. like we talked about last week it's not quite doing the full serial you know, yep. somebody's literally dangling and a voice says, will they make it? Uh, but it still has much more of an energy of, uh-oh, what's coming next? You know, from uh, Vader's eyes opening to Leia running from Riva to now Lola's, you know, red eye lighting up. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a real commitment to the cliffhanger vibe that is a part of Star Wars. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely love that. And uh, yeah, that, that Lola stuff, it was particularly painful considering this was the week we all kind of learned, because I, I didn't know this, that that... Carrie Fisher had a pet bird named Lola as a kid. And I was like, oh, that's so sweet. Oh, no, you can't do this to Lola. You can't do this to Lola. <laughs> that was there. Yeah, no, uh, I'm with you on that. And, and a couple other things uh, for me, if, if yeah. I made it to return Please. to it, is, is, is the overall picture. Um, I always, you know, want to acknowledge some stuff. And, and just based on conversations I've had with friends offline and, and uh, you know, in the last couple of weeks, the looks of these shows is always interesting. I mentioned Mando season one, Ken, because that is a, is, a, is a pundit that struggled with, uh, the early days of the volume or I'd, I'd love movies. And so sometimes things will seem bigger on a movie screen because it is literally bigger. You're sitting in a theater versus your, <laughs> your couch. And so I understand. And I talked about with the Vader fight last week, sometimes things seem to be a little smaller or they seem to look a little different. And I had some moments where, by the way, the fortress inquisitories look marvelous. Marvelous, mm -hmm. I say. Loved uh, down below. Loved uh, just looking out of the ocean. I thought that was a, a, a great example. Some of the, like I said, some of the speeders coming up, the ships landing. It, it, it took me out the first, on the first viewing, and I think that's okay. With the flip, I know some people are having struggling with the, the lightsaber effects here, which you and I were talking about. It's not necessarily new. Um, I personally love it. It stands out. It's very realistic because I think that's what a lightsaber would look like in the dark. It would be very bright and illuminate a lot of things around it, including your face. Um, but those are all fair things to say and, and, and fair things to kind of point at the screen and go, oh, I don't know how that looks. I just uh, always encourage you when you're on that this this highway of discussion, that's the first off ramp. Don't don't take it. Keep going. Push past it. Know it's there. Yes, we're going to talk about it. Yes, there's limitations of budget or limitations of tech. And this is a tech that's always growing because that's what Star Wars does. Um, we're here to, to to look past that and and to to get into what the episode is saying. Yeah, no, I think it is a real risk to, to keep yourself uh, on the surface. And in general, uh, I think I've said this before, is, you know, somebody who grew up with a classic Doctor Who, uh, where hope in hubris is what makes it work of like, mm -hmm. <laughs> we want to tell, uh, we, we have a relatively limited budget, uh, but we want to tell a story about a person who travels through all of time and space, <laughs> and will just make it work. I've always been much more about the spirit of it and if mm -hmm. you i'd rather see uh you know creators reach a little bit and if something's wobbly that's okay i think mm -hmm. maybe the amount that other people are concerned about it uh, i it, i'm trying not to internalize but i there were definitely a couple of moments with the ships where it's like oh i wonder if people are going to be uh, you know yeah. Uh, yeah frustrated by that or uh yeah the lightsaber stuff is fascinating to me because the uh, the lightsabers illuminating people mm -hmm. has been around since the prequels featured heavily in yeah. the sequels 
Uh, but I think it's being used to a very specific and a haunting effect yeah. in Kenobi. So I understand why it's resonating with people. Uh, and you and I were talking before we started broadcasting. I think it's also uh, with the lightsaber, it's weird to live in a time where I guess it's weird to have been al alive for so long where uh, <laughs> when I was introduced to, to lightsabers, they were an absolute fantasy object th that nothing in real life is going to come close to simulating them. Right. Uh, and now we live in this era where, you know, you can buy online or go to Galaxy's Edge and, and build a lightsaber and you can take photos that look damn good, right? Yeah, that yeah. look like you're holding a lightsaber. So it's weird to have traveled from it's an absolute fantasy to when I see Ewan McGregor is Obi-Wan Kenobi. There's the thrill of he has a lightsaber, but there's also like, did he build it at Galaxy's Edge? Because now that's <laughs> yeah. a possibility. Now that's a reality. You know, I really found myself kind of gravitating to the moments where there's the, the true igniting or the true, uh, you know, uh, yeah. or, or turning it off. Um or moments where there, there's a little bit more of like a, a hiss and a buzz and a jitter to it, right? Yeah. Uh, that those are the moments that that uh, I want it to still feel like a faraway fantasy, you know? Yeah. Hey, look, my 1995 Power of the Force telescoping uh, Luke lightsaber looked pretty good for the time, but yes, not like anything <laughs> you'd see on screen. So yeah, it, that, it, it, it doesn't even out. go all the way into the hill, right? <laughs> it does not. No, no. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. great to acknowledge those surface things so that we can uh, move past them. And there's some great ship moments and some great lightsaber moments yeah. uh, that all tie into the big stuff. So let's get into it. Let's talk about the, the big themes, the ideas at stake in this episode. Um, I, I think that the, uh, the overall show is definitely continuing on these themes of childhood trauma, uh, breaking cycles of violence or questioning if they can. Uh, I thought the big emphasis in this episode, I thought it was um, featured in lots of different ways, but I really thought this episode was uh, about hope, right? Of mm -hmm. uh, getting closer to what Obi-Wan needs to do, which is to break through the shackles of the past <laughs> and the shackles yeah. of, of cycles and get closer to a uh, place of hope. Uh, so that's my starting point. How about you? Very similar spot. As always, uh, I love uh, we can look at the same thing and, and approach it from different sides and, and get to the same location there. Uh, uh, hope versus fear is something I wrote down. And I love, uh, as you did last week, uh, talking about Kenobi struggling just to find hope and trust and faith and strangers helping him. And sometimes eh, maybe it goes wrong. And other times, you know, it's just about, hey, you got you to look for that hope. So there's that angle of it. And then just Reva to me, selling fear. Mm -hmm. Buying into fear and doing everything in her power to uh, get Leia to, to, to disconnect from any idea of hope. Uh, mm -hmm. No one's coming for you. No one came for me. So no one's coming for you. Um, and using fear to blot out hope. Uh, I really thought that was powerful. Um, saying, uh, you know, um, even the stuff with Kenobi when she's trying to sell the lie that Kenobi is dead and, and, you know, telling Leia, look, the people I'm looking for, they left him there to die. You're all mm -hmm. alone. You're all alone. The big star Wars theme. So how do you find hope with that? Which is what we know is, is what uh, is at the core of star Wars. And then to build towards that, I really, I wrote down the idea of moving on and moving forward. I, I initially, so like is, is moving on something to, you know, moving on versus moving forward. At the end of the day, I, I watched this episode again. And I was like, I think it's kind of saying the same things in, in, from my point of view. But a lot of examples of um, Kenobi just not ready to be healed from the past, but motivated, needing to move forward and seeing that, that reconnection to the force, this awakening we're talking about here that you, you, you mentioned up top is, is something that's really exciting to see is an example of moving forward. And even if he still feels he's got to save Vader or confront Anakin or whatever it might be, He's taking those steps towards it. He's not living in, in in that unprocessed pain as much as he was. But I think it's building on a lot of things, like you said from last week. This is a great show that's like not leaving themes behind as we move <laughs> on in each episode. It's not resolved, which might be a little bit of the things we're dealing with with uh, Riva, who is constantly living in her pain, dragging others to her pain, uh, and 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 the dark side once again selling this, this false notion of power heals all i'd really love to spend an afternoon talking with uh, the fifth brother over a drink over what hurt him <laughs> um is that so and then my final thing here even going to the what i'm calling the future rebels which is the protector of uh, of the path roken and the team there just when we first meet roken and just saying general that's not my problem um because even and again this is not what the rebellion is this is we're building towards that we're we're, we're years out from what we know but just I, I keep saying the future rebels they're willing to help but they're not ready to accept that they need to fight 
We're not mm-hmm. soldiers, they say. Those are speeders for hauling sewage. And it was a little, I thought, of, ooh, that's kind of cold, Tala, when like the first thing she says is after, you know, Wade dies, well, it looks like you're soldiers now. That's a harsh truth, but that's, uh, hey, you've got to move on. You've got to accept what's right here. And that helps you heal, helps you process, helps you move forward. Yeah, no, I love everything you're saying. And and I want to dive dive deeper into all those things because I'm so on the same page with you. There's so many great ideas. Other thing I wanted to be sure to say early on, because I know it has been a discussion and uh, mm. uh, Luke's film, uh, Disney Plus has added, you know, a warning, I believe, to the first episode. Uh, I do think it's really important and vital that uh, among the many things this show is about, it is about childhood dra- trauma. Uh, but even in this episode with Leia in the torture chair, uh, the, mm-hmm. the youngling entombed, uh, that I, I do want to be respectful and, and uh, uh, give empathy to anybody who's struggling with Kenobi. Um, mm-hmm. I think the show is being responsible because it's about the horror of childhood trauma and the responsibility of uh, mentors and elders to... Mm-hmm. Um, to guide and help children. But I do understand anybody watching who is feeling, who, who, who is being challenged by, I think it's meant to be challenging. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I'm right there with you on that in, in, in terms of it's meant to be challenging. But then I, in saying that, I always, and this goes to a lot of the stuff that happened uh, when, when I, break, I break down all the Game of Thrones stuff weekly still too, where it's like, that you still have to be careful of intentions and sometimes, you know, asking, hey, why are you, why are you doing this? Why are you showing this? I think that's always fair to ask. Um, and so you're going to run that risk and, and you have to try to be responsible, whether it's a warning um, or how far you go. I thought this struck a good balance. But again, that's my my experience with it and my point of view. So I'm with you on if, if this got you a little bit. That is uh, that is uh, definitely a truth. And we understand it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it for me is I feel like as this show goes on, that was my opinion of it at the beginning. The fact that it starts with the the order 66 from the perspective of kids, that it is uh, about childhood trauma. It is about Obi-Wan feeling he, he failed this boy, Anakin Mm -hmm. ultimately, uh, and, and many others suffered because of it, uh, that the show is continuing to center that, um, I think is I think it's an important vital story. I don't think the show is doing anything it shouldn't, but I also right. have empathy for people who are, are, might be struggling with it right now. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, moving on then from some of the the trauma to the opposite. <laughs> uh, what, <laughs> one of the big picture ideas I wrote down is reawakening and healing in particular, and I really thought that was. Yeah. Obi-Wan's journey in particular. I thought it was really powerful that the episode starts with the literal trauma and literal submersion, right? We start mm-hmm. with the possibility of healing uh, with Kenobi being put in the in the Bakhti tank and, uh, and, and Vader in his tank, uh, uh, both of them sort of thrashing around and, mm. and it would mm. appear to be reliving the battle. Um, I thought... Th- one of the values of that is Kenobi is experiencing these visions of maybe a possibility of what it is to ignite a lightsaber and what it is to be a Jedi, right? He hasn't mm-hmm. used that lightsaber in a long time. The first time he, in theory, the last time he used it was to cut down his friend right. uh, because he felt he had to. Uh, and then he doesn't use it for years. And the first time he uses it again, it's in desperate defense against this monster mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that his friend has become and his friend is accusing him of making it. So you can just feel in his flashes that just like a lightsaber being a Jedi is just, it's just violence and trauma. And and to me, it gets the heart of like, that's the fear that all these, all the Jedi who, who walk away for a time, you know, this is, Mm. this is sequel era Luke, the fear that is this what a Jedi is? Is this what happens every time I ignite my blade? So we start from that place of trauma and then the literal healing of uh, the burns, um, w- you know, the story gets moving and Tala has that great line that I think you were highlighting mm-hmm. where she says to him, your body's not the only thing that needs to heal Ben. Uh, but he's already been doing some healing, right? Uh, yeah. Throughout this, he, Leia has been awakening hope, the the realization that Quinlan is still out there, that that people are taking risks to help others, that the Jedi flame, you know, the spark of the Jedi is is still alive. Um, I think has pushed through some of Kenobi's, uh, you know, boundaries, some of the doors that he's closed. Mm -hmm. Um, He's still wrestling with trust, which I think is partially because he, he trusted Anakin so implicitly, you know, there's even that line, Revenge of the Sith, like he's never let me down. Um, 
so I think he, he's he is already a little bit farther along the path to the point where you know he pops out of that uh, that uh, Bakhti tank and has the classic "Where's so and so?" a great Star Wars line. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Where's the person I care about? Where's Han? Where's Ray? You know, where's Padme? Yeah. Um, so he, he knows he has to act. He pushes everybody to act. Mm. Uh, so there's there's no question of like, I'm going to act. I have to rescue Leia. I can't fail Leia. Yeah. But then we get this great, you know, little scene where he is uh, still struggling to open himself up to the force and to let go of the past. And I think there's this really pivotal quote there from Tala. Uh, well, well, Tala mm-hmm. instigates the quote uh, where she gives him the same encouragement that Bale did in the first episode of the, you got to move on mm-hmm. from the past. And the pivotal quote to me is, is Obi-Wan saying some things can't be forgotten. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I think he means that from the dreams he's been having, the the visions he's had, you know, in the Bakhti tank of the trauma, right? Mm-hmm. But then I think there's a change when he actually goes to the fortress and he sees it's a real face your fear, right? He sees yeah. the worst of it. He's been sitting there on Tatooine feeling like not only did I fail Anakin, but by failing Anakin, I failed all of the Jedi. I failed the galaxy, but I failed the Jedi. I failed, you know, my my people. Uh, so I think there there's a tragedy, obviously, in facing his fear in seeing uh, this horror of all these entombed Jedi. But but I think there's this kind of double thing going on where seeing some of the older Jedi, like mm. Terrace Inube, oh. <laughs> rest oh. in peace, uh, I think there's a power in, in seeing the Jedi there as a reflection of himself. Like they're mm-hmm. dead and they're fossilized and they're inactive. Yeah. And then there's a moment where he sees the youngling, which is of course horrific and tragic, but at the same moment hears or feels Leia's screams while looking at that youngling and it to me it's this beautiful moment of fully facing your fear I think he still has to go through it with Anakin but with his failure of the Jedi of this sort of moment where I'm looking at the absolute worst of the truth of what happened and in this moment right now I can choose to be broken by it or I can choose to move forward and there's that moment where he could be frozen in the past, fossilized like those dead Jedi. Mm-hmm. But when he hears Leia's screams, it pushes him toward very immediately moving past a lot of his pain to this ideal state of a Jedi where he is acting in this moment, not living in the past or worrying about the future, responding to the moment and acting in true defense. And from that moment on, he pops into uh, uh, this path toward the Obi-Wan we know. Mm-hmm. And I think there's this this great moment uh, where he is doing what he must do. He is using the lightsaber. He is using the force. It is growing. But after that, the takedown of the, the troopers in the seeker droid, there's that little half twirl. It's not quite there yet. He's getting <laughs> back in the rhythm. And the the first yeah. time I watched this, I it, it just his earlier line, "Some things can't be forgotten," rang in my head. Mm-hmm. And it was like at the beginning of the episode, he was saying, "Trauma can't be forgotten." Mm-hmm. And when he opened himself up and was acting in the moment in defense, and it was Obi Wan Kenobi starts to get his groove back, and it was yeah. like, "Yes, I know this. This is his using the Force, using the lightsaber, uh, protecting, defending." This is the most natural thing in the world to me. Some things can't be forgotten. Some good things can't be forgotten either. Yeah, it's big, big ideas, big Star Wars ideas. It's not about destroying the past, building from the past, learning from the past. This, this unprocessed pain we keep talking about. I think uh, what you're talking about has as echoes of uh, twin sons, Kenobi in the desert, igniting that blade to defend Luke. Right? It's the same image. This to me was the ignition that I, I wanted. It was um, played a little differently. It's played dramatically. It's mm-hmm. played beautifully, shot beautifully, the, the red over Leia, the darkness, the blue. But yeah, I think this was that ignition. This is the, the step forward. Um, he is, he's uh, definitely mindful of, of, of the present, right? He's definitely there. Like you said, he's in this moment, but it's about fighting for the future to me, if that uh, makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and Leia being part of that. And so it's, it's a one-to-one comparison at the moment. You see the 
youngling, you hear her screams and you're so right. Am I, am I going to be stuck in this hallway or the Jedi truly dead? He said that many, many times already in this show, especially mm-hmm. I was rewatching episode one. I mean, that's his, that's his point of view. Uh, I, I have a mission, but even then we talked about, even with the stuff with Owen, it's just like, I don't know. It's routine. Uh, it is just this, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I'm here to train him when, when the time comes. And it, it, it's like, I don't even know if you believe that right now. Like, I don't know. Like, it's just me looking back at episode one of this series. It's, it's him failing to make, needing a connection with Luke and failing to make it, right? Yeah. He can't even, he knows that, that that little grasp of hope he needs is to make a connection to the future, to the possibility of training Luke. And, and mm-hmm. right now it's just a toy that he scrapes up and saves for. Yeah. And even that is rejected, that attempt, that connection. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. And and some of it maybe not as uh, fault of his own. And Owen's got his reasons. And I, I hope we get mm-hmm. more Owen and Baru. And I'm, I'm looking forward to all that. But uh, again, expectations going to be in check. Um, so yeah, I'm with you. And going back to even the beginning of the sequence, if my I may, I love mm-hmm. one of my favorite um, things in the show is the use of Vader in his tank, and now intertwined with with Kenobi in the back. The scene here, man, so powerful, and just this idea of Kenobi's mind kind of being clogged, like you said, things he doesn't want to forget, can't forget. Um, uh, they're really good. The flashbacks are really on point. Whether it's this episode, or the ones before, like you said, the highlights of him seeing more of Anakin as a kid. Shout out to Jake Lloyd showing up on screen again as the Anakin that kind of set the template for a lot of things going forward. Um, so from that, and then just I am haunted by the use of Vader. It is um, brutal. I keep saying it, 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 to praise Vader is just simply a, a badass villain. Is to overlook overlook what the the core is this painful broken soul that is stuck in all this where you know he can't get out <laughs> kenobi's crawling out of the back to vader's there until uh he asks vinay to press a button i guess um, <laughs> as i'm speaking generally of course i don't know the details of his tube but you know what i mean i just that that was a great start for where we are with these two characters as, as they head towards uh whatever might be the the next step in their confrontation yeah, no, I'm, I think it's it's such a great Kenobi story because the the Jedi is, w- with a pure heart is still there. He's just really damaged. And it's, you know, at, at his height, when Maul is torturing him uh, by hurting people Kenobi loves, Kenobi just doesn't break, right? And, yeah. and there's shades of this where Vader is doing, you know, exactly what Reva is doing to Leia. I'm going to put you uh, through what I went through and that will, of course, break you as it broke me. And it will prove to me mm-hmm. that, you know, that that's the way reality is. We all just do cruel things to one another. And then we, and then we fight for domination. Uh, yeah. And Vader literally dragging him into the past, a past made of flames and seeing them. He, he's brought Kenobi to literally where he is in the Bakta tank. And, you know, you can get the sense that Vader thinks this will break Kenobi. And it mm-hmm. doesn't. And I think the, the needle that is threaded so well in this episode for Kenobi's journey is... Um, of course he's going to go after Leia. Of course he is going to uh, be a Jedi, but he's still wrestling with those doubts of, can I, how do I do that? And I think like the episode gives us some how of, you know what, Mm -hmm. when the moment comes, jump off the cliff and it will come back to you, you know, or maybe to use Quinlan's quote that he just read, you know, Mm. you know, Mm. he closes his eyes and lets it happen, you know? Yeah. Um, And I think all of it, you know, it, it builds to that, this great image of, um, you know, having to, there's no question of, can I, there's no doubt of like, I was on the ship and I could barely move a little tool across a box. It, he holds back the force of an ocean, right. Yeah. And, and redirects it. And what a great visual to just say like, okay, this isn't even baby steps. This isn't just take your time. Like Tala told him twice is like, this has to be now. This is mm-hmm. who I have to be now. And so mm-hmm. I will open yeah. myself and I will. And what, an, what a great image to have it be uh, this, catharsis uh, uh of of water flowing i yeah. mean there's a limit to how beautiful it is since it's uh practical purposes to, to drown a bunch of people <laughs> but is, it still has that that haunting. power of you know right <laughs> and then I, I think for me the, the the way this whole this path of uh this theme this arc in this individual episode yeah. of kenobi's reawakening and healing is that one of the things he's been denying himself or failing to get is connection, right? Yeah. Um, he doesn't trust anybody. Uh, he doesn't trust himself. He trusted Anakin when he maybe shouldn't have, but also blames himself for mm-hmm. the failing Anakin. He doesn't think he has any worth. He doesn't think even if he tried to help people, he could. 
goes back to Leia's line of, is it that hard to believe that you could have friends? Right. It goes to his re- reawakening, the first steps of uh, reawakening in, in that Jedi safe house when he realizes other people are still out there and connecting. And all of that, I think, is paid off when Leia reaches out and yeah. takes his hand. And that, that hand holding is, you know, the answer to earlier uh, when Tala says, your body's not the only thing that needs to heal, Ben. It, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> that's little Leia's emotional Bakta hand, right? And the tenderness between them yeah. where he, he gets this wonderful um, reward, honestly, of helping others helps ourselves, you know? Mm-hmm. And that that connection was so so beautiful and so healing. Yeah, healing being key, and I think that that little uh, that little handhold uh, um, that um, is is just reached out into the Star Wars fandom and melted hearts. I, I think it's right now one of my favorite scenes so far in the series, and it's so key to Leia. We're talking about the building blocks of Leia, but I think you're really right. This idea of Kenobi being disconnected. We've talked for years of old man in the desert, right? We want a campfire show of him sitting around, and instead we're seeing the effects of what of 10 years of that and 10 years of being haunted, 10 years of being clogged, and 10 years of just, yeah, where we pick him up in the show, uh, we're not just building back his fighting skills. We're building back his simple ability to accept any kind of support, love, hope that anyone else is around him to help him with this. And he's all there. I think it's a very realistic spot to be in. Don't we all kind of feel that at times? Don't you all kind of feel that you're going through things by yourself? And it's so easy to isolate. And and, and that's the lie. Depression will sell you that you're alone. Um, and, and and have someone like Leia, who has this such this wonderful intuitive skill, force skill or not. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of force, but it's also her. It's also mm-hmm. her being able to see past that. And that's the new hope connection. Again, we're going to go back to it. But th- this is her putting the blanket on Luke. While he's suffering and she's holding back so much suffering. I love that moment. I think it's so key to what the show is saying and what this episode was about. Yeah. And it was so about connection, right? Like, I mean, we, we see Leia in the original trilogy era and the sequel trilogy era is somebody who does put her pain to the side to help lead. And I feel like in this moment, it was almost like it was almost equal, right? Of like Leia being like, I've been through hell and I know you have too. And it would help me and I know it would help you. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Let's hold hands. You know, it's so, uh, it's so tender and so great. Um, So great. And I think it it leads to, I want to deep dive a little bit more on one of the great ideas that you brought up. It it is hope versus fear. But I also thought that this episode was really drilling down on the idea of of hope versus fear as uh, reflected by connection versus domination. Like Mm -hmm. to me, that's what's going on in the contrast between uh, our, our heroes and our villains, uh, but also the path and Fortress Inquisitorious, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the path is a, a literal and metaphorical chain of people helping one another <laughs> versus <laughs> the command structure of the Inquisitors in the Empire is all about rigidity and, and domination. You know, even seeing kind of a classic scene of Tala using fear to manipulate the guard, right. Of like, Mm -hmm. Oh no, maybe she's more powerful than me and we'll get in trouble with people even more powerful than me. Uh, Vader's ongoing classic managerial style (laughs) is all about domination, you know, and there is, it's, 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 uh, you know, Mm -hmm. metaphorical and emotional, but it is also literal, right? The, the, the path is linear. It is moving from planet to planet. It is forward moving in the fortress is this spire, like you were talking about, this, mm-hmm. you know, dagger driven into the ocean uh, that is built on the death of Jedi, built on, it's not enough that we killed the Jedi. We want to be able to go down here and remind ourselves that we did it, mm-hmm. <laughs> that we are stronger than them, that our path is is better and stronger, that we dominated them. It's this spire built on the need to dominate. Yeah, and, and this, and this, this power that runs through it all that they crave, that they feel they have, oh man, fear just dominates everything uh, throughout. Um, I love it. And look, we get so deep here. We, we always joke. Uh, we, we go so deep. We go two hours into Dexter, but also I always joke that you and I point at the screen and go, Hey, look, one thing's called the path. <laughs> the other thing's a fortress. <laughs> Do you see the difference here? And again, I was, I, I really, Really loved. And I don't know if this was the first reveal. I did play Fallen Order, but I haven't spent a ton of time uh, diving into the depths of Inc- Fortress Inquisitorious. So I don't know if other people are like, oh, yeah, it's the tombs down there. I don't know. To me, this was the first time. I, 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 it was so effective. 
Like a lot, it's evil. It's cruel. It is kind of traumatic. It is like you said, uh, just that sequence alone. Seeing the youngling is the last one there. Seeing that youngling, hearing the screams of Leia, the torture going on. Um, that's the point. This is why I have taken my Imperial hat off and bought a Rebel Insignia baseball cap. <laughs> it's not that I don't think the Imperials still have the cooler toys because they do. And they, Reva looks great. Like, they, they, they give me a black outfit with a red saber any day. I get it. But to to prop that up, to focus on the badass of it all. And these characters are badass. But we keep saying there's this point to it that it's hollow. It's hollow. It's so based on fear. And Star Wars continues to come back to that. And you're right. This organic path of people, of wood walls, <laughs> they're, 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 they're literally moving forward for the better of everyone versus a fortress in, in, like you said, a dagger in the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and I, I had checked one of uh, the great uh, Star Wars Explained videos on Fortress Inquisitorius and a quick uh, survey of the uh, Wikipedia site is I think the tombs were, were what, what was new. Uh, the, that was the right. area we didn't go into <laughs> in Fallen Order for those of us who, who played it, which I think really gives so much weight to this episode and to this vision of hope versus fear, connection versus domination. Uh, the, the characters who take the risk to connect get something. Uh, mm -hmm. th there's risk and there's pain and there's loss, uh, but they move forward and uh, heal uh, mm -hmm. and, and reawaken. Whereas for the characters who focus on domination, it's just more and more games of domination and they don't ever truly get what they want. Um, yeah. And I, I loved how much that was set up in this episode of this this relationship between uh, Leia and Reva. Once I got past my expectations of what I was hoping <laughs> yeah. would happen in this episode with Reva, and again, mm -hmm. still hopeful for those things, and, and yeah. we'll see if they do happen. But I thought it was such a great uh, contrast that Leia holds on to her hope that Ben will come for her or that somehow mm -hmm. her father will help, yeah. and her connections give her strength to keep you know staying strong and resisting. And Reva is so certain that loss and pain are inevitable. You pointed it out with the great line, uh, uh, the braver you seem, the more afraid you are. Uh, yeah. Her perspective that everybody is living in fear. She says the people you are trying to protect, they are not coming for you. The only person that can save you now, Leia, is you. And that is Reva speaking from, you know, an experience of trauma, we believe, of what uh, Inquisitors go through to become Inquisitors, that they are tortured if she is indeed uh, a Jedi Padawan who is not saved uh, by any brave Jedi, it, you, you can understand where she is coming from. But as an attack on Leia, it is saying, hey, everything that is giving you strength, Leia, your ideas of connection, they aren't real. That's not the way the galaxy works. No one will come for you. And Reva is, of course, you know, uh, proven wrong <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, when Kenobi and, uh, and other brave people come for her. Um, yeah. and, and I really like how the, all that tracks to Lola itself too right that mm. the idea that not only is it just a a sad truth that we are alone and the only person who could possibly save you is you uh it, it's not just a sad truth it's that connection is a weakness to Reva, you know mm -hmm. and she exploits that bond with lola which is one of my favorite lines rewatching is Reva saying i had a droid when i was younger too it was taken from me like everything else in yeah. the first episode, I was like, okay, yes, uh, yeah, Reva's been through some trauma. Tell me more about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then when I rewatched the episode, knowing what Reva was going to do to Lola, I had a droid when I was younger, too. It was taken from me like everything else had way more weight because it was Reva actively, you know, polluting mm -hmm. Leia's connection to Lola. Uh, Leia's, you know, innocent childhood love of a droid of her friendship, of her connection, and just polluting that and trying to use it as a weakness. Yeah, more dark side lies. Oh, there's some great stuff in here that you're saying, man. Of, of And just talk about, about, about Reva. Uh, this is not what, this is what I'm saying the episode was saying, but just I've become obsessed with her obsession with the path and what mm -hmm. she's finding, how long she's been digging into this, how much she knows, what she's learning in these episodes, but how much of it might be similar to this little wrinkle in the story of Maul of why wasn't I found by the Jedi? Why wasn't mm -hmm. I saved? And why right. was my life then made into uh, a nothing but pain, suffering and vengeance since a, a giant hole that's never filled? And how much is, is, is Reva going, no one came for me. Uh, no one put me on a path. 
I wasn't there and how much that is fueling her and how much that is going to lead to, I don't know if she's going to be redeemed. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know, but I'd love to, to, to find out. I'd love to have a monologue from her. Right. I'm waiting for that. <laughs> waiting for the, let me tell you what went wrong. Um, because I just, yeah, it, it just seems to be, it, it happens, you know, right. It, it's where a lot of that, uh, you know, the bluster is, is hiding where the true pain, pain is coming. I just keep seeing her when she ripping, ripping off that symbol. Of, uh, on the wood, mm-hmm. off the wall, slamming it down, and how that is a symbol of hope. But it wasn't for her. She didn't get that chance, and how she can't uh, deal with that. It's unprocessed right now, and it's not easy, as we know. So, anyways, that, and I want to also bring in a little bit of Leia stuff too. I love that. That's a great line. Uh, what she's saying, and and saying to Leia, like, no one's coming for you. The only one who can rescue you is you, which is what Reva feels uh, maybe about her life. But I love, and this, I'm just putting this out there. You, you tell me what you think, Joseph, of, of how that also <laughs> fuels the idea of the self-rescuing princess, which mm-hmm. Leia is, but that's not necessarily that she's always going to be the one to break herself out of the prison. She needs other people. So it's this strength to, to, to keep hope alive. It's the strength to, I will survive. I will not give up my, my, my friends. I will not give up the position. I will stay alive. And then I believe in the hope that others will rescue me versus just, you know, a little bit of, you know, Get into the garbage chute, fly boy. Yeah, we know she has that in her. That is the part of uh, her self-rescuing princess uh, identity that we all love and are inspired by. But just see it, see the building blocks of that, of her kind of going, I am alone right now. I'm being told I'm alone, but I will stay alive to uh, reconnect with those out there. It's a little thing I took from it. Absolutely. And I love in the Leia and Riva scenes that Leia goes through multiple tactics, right? She tries mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know it's a yes. tactic, right? Because she doesn't. Yes. She's not particularly big on being a princess. It's just waving, and she doesn't doesn't really get what it's all about yet. But she tries mm-hmm. the "I am a haughty princess." She tries yeah. the "Ooh, this is not going to work out for you." Uh, diplomatically, she tries the the faking emotions. She tries the you know manipulating. Mm-hmm. Like, well, if we're all on the same side, and my father is an imperial senator, and this is all just about the empire, let's just call my dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She she does a lot to to keep the fighting spirit. And I think that's what's so important about star wars is star wars i think celebrates the individual from the perspective that we all have agency and choice and we should do our best to make the right choice uh but star wars i don't think ever uh has a a fantasy that the one individual can do everything by themselves it it is uh, celebrating the individual and the community equally so it's so key that that Leia is a, is a princess who rescues herself, but everyone in Star Wars needs help from other people. The greatest, most powerful characters uh, need help. Uh, Luke, you know, does not destroy the Death Star without, you know, Scoundrel <laughs> and his uh, friendly dog, uh, you know, Wookiee showing up to help, you know? Yeah. that That is so core to Star Wars. And I, I kind of think that's active in this episode. Um, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh, th- and that was kind of, for me, like the last big idea is this idea of a little bit of justice for the Jedi, but also a little bit of uh, what's worth fighting for. Mm-hmm. Um, the series has been, you know, very concerned, like we talked about with the trauma of children, with stopping uh, the cycle of violence, uh, with uh, protecting loved ones. And all of that was present. But this episode really centered the path that that's what was being protected this episode. Certainly Leia was being protected. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But also the knowledge that she has about what the path is uh, was being uh, protected. And the Jedi and who are they? Are they worth this was centered? You know, yeah. Reva's saying things like the Empire doesn't take kindly to Jedi sympathizers. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, obi Wan saying to to Roken, I need your help. And Roken says, so does every kid making a rock float from here to Coruscant. So really centering Force mm-hmm. users and Jedi is the people who need help. and. I think Obi-Wan chooses to stand up for Leia, uh, but also for the fallen Jedi of the past mm-hmm. and and for the mm-hmm. future of Force users everywhere. He he is choosing to stand up not just for Leia, but for this, this realization that the Jedi uh, flame is not entirely extinguished. Uh, it, it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Go go for it. I, I, that's why I actually give this episode a big thumbs down because he didn't yell, for Tara Sanube at any point. <laughs> at any point, he didn't say it. I think he did in his eyes. He did. I, I read that. Yeah. <laughs> when I subtitle the Disney Plus episode, it'll be Obi-Wan Kenobi's eyes scream 
for Tara Sanubi. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I don't mean to un- undercut your big point. I'll just, I want no, to no, add no. to one here thing of, of, I love the exchange with, with Riva and, and Tala. Actually, I love all of it. I just love what they're both doing. Moses Ingram, I thought had some of her best moments in this episode. Love with the, the fist, the clinch, like almost when Leia's like trying out some more. <laughs> uh-huh. <"Yeah>, <laughs> love that. Um, but I love uh, Indira Varma so much. Uh, and th- this idea that, um, you know, uh, uh, this exchange at the end where she's like, traitor, you know, you betraying everything you are. Where Tal is like, I've never stood for this. I figured that out early on. And knowing who you are for the benefit of others. So a little bit of what we're talking about here, too, of this stay strong so you can help others and others can help you. And that connection that the, the light side's constantly asking for or, or helping you find. Yeah, no, I so agree with that. And I think it's just going on with with every character, right? Like Leia is smart enough to know that obviously she is, you know, fighting for her own preservation in her own life, but she's also fighting to protect the path, to protect mm-hmm. the Jedi and people who need help. And it is made so clear from the image of that Jedi symbol slapped down on a table. You know, Leia saying to Obi-Wan, I didn't tell them anything. And Obi-Wan mm-hmm. saying, I know that that's what's center on Leia's mind, not like, ah, uh, not oh I'm I'm alive and we're gonna make it off like I didn't mm-hmm. tell them anything she's so aware of her choice to stand up to protect the path and the Jedi uh, mm-hmm. I love everything you're saying about Tala that's such a great line but she risks herself you know for this cause of keeping the path safe by going to the fortress at all but then also like Obi Wan says I need a distraction and she doesn't hem she doesn't haw she just goes and tries to BS Reva. <laughs> yeah. That's a huge risk, a huge sacrifice. And then I think we're also seeing that, you know, reflected in Roken, where he resists at first, but then becomes willing yeah. to take a risk. And then the other uh, uh, pilots, uh, Wage and Sully, I believe. Um, Wait, I think it was Wade. Wade, Wage. Yeah. <laughs> Wage would be an interesting Star Wars name. <laughs> uh, Wade and Sully uh, become willing to mm-hmm. contribute right yeah. um and, and that that is this great little uh mini story for them of we're not soldiers uh, those speeders are for hauling sewage like you talked about to the the kind of brutal but kind of realistic guess you're so- soldiers now after all yeah. and all of it to me was everybody is is making this choice to protect the path protecting jedi protecting force sensitive people across the galaxy uh but like so many Star Wars stories, this is really about Obi-Wan is the character who says, this can't stand. I have to go find Leia. I will go on my own when I can barely stand. Yeah. And he goes through his own arc as a Jedi and his powers are extremely important and valuable in saving Leia and in saving Leia, saving the path for now. But this is one of those great stories where a Jedi is an individual. It's not, I'll go in there alone and I'll mess everybody up and I'll emerge alone a hero because nobody could stand up to me, great Jedi. Mm. His powers matter, but what matters more for Obi-Wan Kenobi re-emerging Jedi is that he is an inspiration. Mm. And mm. everybody else acts because Obi-Wan says, even if no one is, is willing to risk themselves, I have to go after her. And Reva says, okay, then I'll go with you. And I'll take risk after risk after risk. And Roken says, okay, I'll help you even start on the path. And then Wade and Sully say, okay, we will show up and we will help you. And this is this is like Luke taking down the Death Star. Mm. Obi-Wan and Leia rescue themselves up to a point, mm-hmm. but it is connection and their inspiration as leaders that truly saves them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Breha Organa saying to to Leia in episode one, well, all, all I do is wave, then do more. Then do more. Yeah, yeah, then do more. And for me is, you know, anybody who's listened to our Clone Wars report where <laughs> we talk about justice for the Jedi, even when they make the, their mistakes, uh, to me, the story of Star Wars is not that the Jedi are bad. It's that the Jedi are walking a very noble path that it is easy uh, to fall from. And some of the stories in the prequel era is about are about the mistakes that they made. Yeah. And this is a story about Obi-Wan wrestling with some of those mistakes. But this particular episode, it felt like here's what the Jedi are. Their hope, their connection, their uh, generational kindness, passing on what you have learned and helping the next generation. And everybody is fighting to keep those true 
core ideals of the Jedi alive. The Jedi, this was like total Last Jedi stuff for me of like, mm-hmm, the Jedi mm-hmm. must survive because look at what an inspiration it is when Obi-Wan says, this will not stand, I must act. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, sorry. I, I'm actually really moved by that of just of just the idea of what the, the, the true meaning of the path isn't just about, of course, it's a key a component to save the lives of these uh, mostly youngsters uh, going around the galaxy. Yes, but it's it's the big why behind it, right? Why are they doing yeah. it? We need them. It's Lor Senteca. We need the light. We need the Jedi. It's 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 all the, the that big question in Star Wars time and time again, where it isn't just a matter of Jedi are bad. They did bad things, and this is uh, the order fell, and uh, we don't need them, or we need gray Jedi that touch rage. No, no, it's keeping the 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 tenets of of the order, the the heart of of uh, the Jedi's kyber, if you will, uh, keeping it alive because of we what it means for the galaxy. Absolutely behind you on that. Yeah, I mean it's Luke on crate of like, yeah, maybe a part of it is knocking down all those walkers with a wave of, of my hand, but what the what the people really need is a symbol of hope and inspiration. They need Mm -hmm. to tell these stories and they need to believe that they can walk this path too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, obviously all these big ideas and themes reflect a lot of the, the larger themes and storytelling of star Wars, but but was there anything else that you wanted to focus on in in terms of reflections of larger storytelling? Yeah, no, we've touched upon it, but to to highlight it uh, and how this connects to the overall story of star Wars and what star Wars is, is, is preaching quite frankly, preaching Uh, selflessness selflessness all through this episode lots of actions in this episode that put the needs of others above the safety of the individual time and time again and you should Mm -hmm. feel it's a repeating theme you should feel it's constantly in your face this episode is all about it perhaps even more than the previous episodes more direct um there and and perhaps again none more than leia just refuses to give up information for her own safety and that is something we will see from her time and time again but her getting the value of it already being on the ground and seeing well what's going on here you're saying there's bad things but the empire is 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 good and she doesn't quite know that this is a rebellion yet she's going to learn that in about six years or so in the (laughs) events of leia princess of alderaan if you're looking for facts and canon beats but this is the spirit of it and her driving that forward and and how um, just how powerful that is. And uh, Tala's got it, Aroka, and the loss of Wade. Yeah, it's all there. It's all direct. Uh, and it should be because Star Wars is preaching that versus the other side. Uh, even Fifth Brother. I love, Sun Kang's great, by the way. So this is mm-hmm. not a critique of him. But he's, I'm just like, you dummy. You just focus it on the promotion. You can't see what's happening. <laughs> like there's, you, you just you're buying in and it's costing you. And 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 Reva's seeing things a little differently, which is why Vader's kind of like, right i like that idea i'm gonna steal that for later because that's also an imperial playbook thing right krennic will tell you <laughs> um tracker oh a tracker let them escape i'm gonna put that in my playbook and uh, maybe tarkin will like that one day anyways it, it's the two sides the path versus the fortress it's all about selflessness yeah absolutely and, and what i really liked in this episode is it is about selflessness and we and we see some people truly pay the price a scene uh, Solly's absolute sadness uh, about losing Wade. And, and this is why we were trying to stay out of any sort of direct conflict because this loss happens. We see the pain uh, of loss, the, the, the risk of sacrifice. But then with Obi-Wan and Leia's, uh, you know, wonderful touching moment at the end, we also see that helping others is often the best way to help yourself. Yes. Yes. The re- the reward of selflessness is a weird way to phrase it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but but I think that is is a truth. Like Obi, if, if what Obi Wan needed to do to get Leia off that was to sacrifice himself, I think he would have in a heartbeat, right? Yeah. Uh, but there's also this like look at what is opening up in him to help others is yes. is really really powerful uh, to me. Um, yeah, I think for me the 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 one of the biggest reflections is just the the tomb itself, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I, I, on my second viewing, like seeing Obi Wan stare at that tomb, my mind just did a, you know a cut to uh, Obi Wan saying in A New Hope, a young Jedi named Darth Vader, who was a pupil of mine until he turned to evil, helped the Empire hunt down and destroy the Jedi Knights. And like mm-hmm. even more power to that classic line, <laughs> like that he could turn to Luke is like seriously, there's a tomb. I saw it, you know? Yeah. Um, that that gives uh, even more weight to what Obi-Wan has experienced. But then, you know, the, the, the flip side of that is that tomb is really a symbol of no matter what they do, no matter how many uh, tombs they fill, they can't fully kill the Jedi. They can't fully kill hope. And in a lot of ways, that is like the story of mm-hmm. Star Wars. Of like, we can kill hope. <laughs> we yeah. can kill light. And they just can't and that's uh, 
ultimately, I think, what's, what's really going on in, in this episode. I agree with that. Awesome. Mm. Well, then let's take a break so we can talk about Terrace Anube for decency's sake. Let's do it. We'll be back here. It'll be one Kenobi report. We are back to continue our discussion of part four of Obi-Wan Kenobi, and we are going to talk canon. There's a lot of great canon stuff, but I must start with the tomb of Terra Sanube. Uh, if you are uh, have not uh, seen Terra Sanube, if you're not familiar with him, uh, he is in the Clone Wars animated series. Uh, some uh, great mentions uh, in uh, some of the publishing side of Star Wars as well. Uh, please, if you want to pay tribute to Terra Sanube, set aside a little time in your day to watch the Clone Wars episode, Lightsaber Lost. That's where Terra Sanube yeah. gets to shine. One of the greatest lines in Star Wars. He's a fish guy. Caber uh, uh, Sane, or, or say Caber Sane, <laughs> Saber Cane. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm so yeah. moved. I can't speak. Uh, yeah, the Saber Cane is absolutely amazing. Uh, and then we see him in the background of lots of episodes uh, watching over younglings uh, when Anakin and Barris are fighting. Uh, he is uh, watching over some younglings and he also whips out the saber cane uh, there. Mm. So Ken, w- when I saw Terra Sanube, I-, I did yell, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's that moment, you know, Obi- Obi-Wan walks in and you-, you get what it is. And then he's turning and you know, you're going to see a close up. And I, it was that frozen moment of who is it going to be? Is it going to be somebody we know? Right. And then I was truly deeply shocked to see Terra Sanube in live action, but not alive. Scream. No. And then mumbled yes, because I was happy to see Terra Sanube <laughs> at all. Uh, what was your emotional reaction to seeing Terra Sanube? Well, in lieu of flowers, please donate to the Justice for the Jedi Fund, uh, the name <laughs> of Terra Sanube. I, I told you earlier, it's like I had a beat where I saw it and was like, okay, okay. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, wait a minute. Like like he had already, Kenobi had moved on to the next Jedi. And I was like, oh, wait, that was Terra <laughs> Sanube. Or, you know, hey, look, there's still this point of time of recording. It could be Bob Sanube, his cousin. We don't know. Maybe Terra got away. I don't know. But no, it works. True. And it also kind of works for some of the bigger themes you know this 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 old venerable jedi who whose job was to to grow and protect the, the future of the jedi order and to seeing him gone and to see seeing him just on display in this horrible way uh, it worked it was effective it moved me and it made me sad and made me worried for you yeah it, it made me sad but it made me excited to see him in other storytelling mm. um my interpretation we'll see if there's a clarification uh, but that that tomb was filled with Jedi who were killed at the temple and during order 66. Mm. Uh, but then also, you know, clearly a lot of people there who are either Jedi in, in hiding or just force sensitive people because they weren't in the garb of Jedi. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I did, I did say like, okay, I could see a, a beautiful truth that, uh, that Tara fell defending younglings in the temple, or maybe Tara got away for a while and there's still mm. <laughs> a fun story to be had. Yeah, mm. but I, I, I really, I, I, it honestly did comfort me to see Obi Wan Kenobi, one of my very favorite characters, be as big of a fan of Terra Sanube as I am, <laughs> and be just as sad. Uh, but I really agree with you that it did have the emotional weight, um, particularly if you know uh, Terra Sanube. Uh, but the idea that he is Terra is this kindly old Jedi who was probably old when Obi-Wan came to the temple for the first time yeah. and that he is this venerable, kindly, older presence that Obi-Wan has known for decades. So, so to have Obi-Wan affected by that and then see everybody else was really powerful. Yeah, no, it, it worked. It was, it was a great choice. I would love to know. Uh, that's one of those interviews I will click on of of uh, some of the thought process to choosing uh, to choosing him of, of all the choices. There's a lot to have, and it was a, it was a it was a great and tragic choice. So I'd love to know a little bit how that happened. I'm sure we'll hear more, but I'm gonna thank and blame Pablo Hidalgo since he's right in the credits. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I mean nothing negative uh, a- at all. I, I really like that he is specifically credited. I think for things like this, of yes. you know, we we don't want it to be you know, uh, Mace Windu without an arm, right? Like, yeah. they, they clearly the creative choice was not to go with somebody that that we mm-hmm. super recognize. Yeah. So, like, 
who is a deep bench character who would still have, you know, some emotional impact. And Terrace Nube is a fascinating suggestion because, hey, he might be hard to make happen in a uh, fully moving live action. <laughs> yeah. But in 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 repose, uh, yeah. Terrace Nube works in live action. Well, and I said up top, like this episode, one part Clone Wars, meaning like it's Kenobi on an adventure type of thing, uh, which ties into Attack of the Clones and all the prequels, I know, but really Clone Wars vibe. And so Terrace Nube just really fits into that as well. Yeah, Honor, yeah. Honor and yeah. and uh, I resisted the urge to do any pausing during my first view because I really try not to pause or rewind and just let the uh, episode wash over me. Uh, but looking back this morning, uh, when Obi-Wan first steps into the hall, uh, one of the uh, other Jedi appears to be an angry uh, Jedi, uh, it's Pablo Jill character in Attack the Clones, uh, and then a Coleman Cadge uh, in Revenge of the Sith. Um, and at one point, Coleman Cash was listed as uh, a Jedi suspected of being alive in the Vader comic uh, around the time of the East Koth hunt. So I thought that was a fun little Easter egg, too, to say, yeah. possibly, yeah, Coleman did live, but Vader got him. And that that made me think back to the Inquisitors being kind of bummed because only dregs <laughs> were left. Yeah. Like, we got all the masters besides Obi-Wan and Yoda, you know? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, so what did you think about the rest of the characters that we saw? Obviously, Terrace Anube has power. The youngling has power. Um, I didn't personally uh, recognize any of the other characters. Um, and I thought th- th- some of them were meant to be, maybe that was a Jedi in hiding. Maybe that was just somebody who happened to be force sensitive, uh, the way uh, Roken describes his wife as being. How did you feel about that? I, I did kind of take it from that point of view of of building on, yeah, you, you were, you know, once the, it was Terrace Anube, then you're, you, it's going to be like a, a roll call of names we know. And it, and it struck me as, like you said, people either on the run, people just out and about in the galaxy, different cultures, different um, you know outfits, um, and how that just, for me, kind of, you know, just struck me of where we are at this time in the timeline and what these Inquisitors are doing. It is not just these uh, random uh, dregs of the Jedi out there fighting with their <laughs> sabers secretly. It's all these also people who... Uh, who just uh, have this, have this force, th- and that that that's that's their sin, and the empire is trying to snuff out that light. So I took it as that as well. It wasn't, I didn't feel it was like someone I need to know. It was what it represented, and and where they were in their lives, and what they are, and who, and, and just who they are. Yeah, no, I think I, I really liked it. Uh, obviously, a great uh, many emotions about Terrace Anube, maybe Coleman, Cash, uh, maybe Pablo Jill, maybe not. But I was really happy that it wasn't a canon checkmark list because I think that would have mm-hmm. taken me out of the emotion of it. And instead, I felt like it was a good representation of what the path is about. Yes, yes, That the yes. path is rescuing Jedi who are on the run, uh, who are active Jedi, and it is, uh, you know, also helping people who maybe never joined the Jedi, uh, who are adults. Um, and I think, it, you know, seeing a couple of those faces and not knowing, like, wow, that could be Roken's wife. Um, that was really, really powerful of just like, that's just your wife who just w- was born sensitive yeah. to the force. And that made her a target, even though she tried to hide it and wasn't even doing anything. Yeah. I, I, it, it, I, I really do think it, it heightened the value of the path. I really think it did. And I, I took it that way. Yeah. Cause, cause um, yeah, again, it could have just been a roll call and it would have been fun, but it, 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 we always ask about the why. And, and that was an important why. Yeah, absolutely. Any other thoughts on the tomb or Terrace Nube before we move on? Again, the only thing I'll say is it is brutal. It is cruel. It is evil. And therefore, I loved it in a way because we kind of needed to be reminded of, of the true uh, evil of the Empire to me and the dark side. Yeah, of, of what is really, really at stake and what is worth fighting for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will enjoy, as people have tweeted at me, I will, I will raise many uh, cocktail toasts. Uh, to the valor of Terra Sanube. But for now, we shall move on. Uh, the T-47. Uh, did you nerd out and get excited when uh, Obi-Wan just said, hey, you got some T-47s back there? I do, man. I love my snow speeders or air speeders, of course. But, uh, you know, it's hard to break that Kenner habit. But I uh, absolutely love them. I thought they nailed the sound, even though some of the beats with them uh, didn't necessarily the execution was uh, you know I, I get it uh not the best but i gotta say on paper man if you're like ooh, Re- reva versus a, a an airspeeder oh that's that's epic <laughs> and, and, and so i'll take the intention there uh and and i love the use of it there and and uh just kind of tracks it now it makes you think because you know the um excuse me the rebellion slowly building resources 
over time. So now um, I wonder if they're like, hey, anyone got some of those sewer ships, the sewer uh, <laughs> transport ships taking raw sewage around? Ships? Yeah, I mean, yeah. They, 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 they yeah. seat a few people and yeah. they've got this great, uh, you know, cable <laughs> yeah. yeah, for hauling stuff. That could be useful. Yeah, no, I mean, this was... Um, uh, I get that maybe the ship CGI was not the most amazing, but I yeah, was yeah. so uh, pumping my fist and so in love with that moment uh, that I was not affected at all. I got excited on the T-47 mention, I think because the, the long journey I've gone on from the uh, the perspective of, of age, uh, they were just the snow speeder, right? When, when yeah. I saw Empire, I was too young to memorize every bit of dialogue and track like, oh, but but they had to be adjusted to the cold. I just had the toy. It was a snow speeder <laughs> and I loved it. Yeah. And, and then it was only when I was older and like watching the VHS uh, tapes again and again, it's like, Oh, wait a minute. They're not snow speeders. They're speeders that have been converted to work mm. in the snow. Yeah. And ever since then, I was like, I want to see some speeders just being speeders. Just go be yeah. T-47s. <laughs> Don't worry yeah. about snow. Move to LA T-47s and forget <laughs> about snow. <laughs> Uh, so, and it's happened in, in lots of other places, but to see it in live action, rescuing Obi Wan Kenobi, to see non snow speeders was just a thrill. In the in the yeah, the, the sounds were yeah. spot on, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely was absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, going to there, I want to talk about this big picture thing that you really focused on in your uh, reaction overall to the episode of just the vibes. <laughs> yeah, there's tons of individual uh, a new hope. Uh, images, ideas, moments, but all of it creates this vibe of this is Obi-Wan sneaking through an Imperial facility. It, it is him literally making a noise with the force to distract mm -hmm. uh, troopers. Uh, Tallest quote, I had company, is hard not to hear as, you know, we're gonna have company. This is uh, Leia resisting torture, being rescued, uh, being uh, allowed to escape with a tracker. There's so much going on here uh, you covered it a little bit at the top, but I'm you're so positive ab about it. I, I would love to hear more of your your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I'll have fun. Let me just I'll run through. This is kind of like a live tweeting of it, <laughs> so it's not every beat because you you mentioned too, like even like the um, that shot of uh, what Tala was using to communicate with Kenobi. It's definitely reminiscent of you know I was expecting three PO's hand to reach in and and, and grab it. Uh, right, it is it, the comm link shot. Yeah, yeah, it is indeed. But yeah, just uh, I'm on a diplomatic mission to Alderaan. A resistance to the mind probe was considerable. Ben using the distraction sound of troopers at work who are, uh, I had my headphones on the second time around. And they're like, this place gives me the creeps. Well, hopefully we won't yes. be here long. It was a great line. Uh, and I think a little uh, of the uh, TK, uh, you know, the, 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 whatever the ongoing joke between Dave Collins and Whitworth when they voice the, the troopers now uh, going back to the new hope moment. Uh, and then uh, this is, uh, this is Ben's fight now, right? This whole thing is Ben, Ben fighting for now fighting for the future. And one day will no longer be literally saying I'm too old for this Luke. And so to him, to have that realization now uh, and to me in the back of his head he's going i gotta go rescue leia i gotta kind of get into an impenetrable fortress that's not my i can't do that anymore and that's that's part of the power of passing it on to the next generation uh this is your fight now uh so i, I thought there was a power a powerful just overall use of it there for me um Ben is told to run at one point. Literally, you almost, you almost heard Tala go, run, Ben, run. Uh, so I love that. Uh, Vader stealing Reva's idea. I said, keeping in line with the Empire's training manual again and how to do it. But just um, that makes a lot of sense, too, uh, which then flows into Leia going, no wonder we got out of here. You know, they're tracking us here. I've been through this before, man. Mm -hmm. um, and then Leia, it, it all ends with Leia putting aside herself to comfort someone else. That that handhold moment we've already talked about, so powerful. It is, is it, it does connect. And it's not just about, hey, y'all remember that stuff? Remember that stuff you love? And if anyone comes at, at me with the nostalgia stuff again, I'm, I'm going to throw them in the drink like Kenobi does to that stormtrooper. <laughs> I'm so tired of that. Engage with what it means. Yes, it is reminiscent of it. Yes, it's that poetry that we all can make fun of because George in that flannel shirt loves saying that, but there's a reason. And there's a reason the repeated themes. And it is a, a, a check. It's a gut check of where they are right now and, and who they will become and the building blocks. This series emerging as Little Leia's building blocks is powerful to me because this is the character that has changed the galaxy and changed in a lot of our ways, our own pop culture. Leia is such an inspiration. The legacy of Leia is so strong. The legacy of Carrie Fisher is so strong. And now to actually see it at play, to see it grow, to see it uh, more than just, oh, she's cute. Uh, you know, uh, it's powerful stuff to me to watch it play out again. 
that it isn't just a playbook she now has. Oh, they're trying to interrogate me. I can resist it. It's who she is and it's her nature. And it comes naturally, but also she's learning. She's learning the full scope of the power of the empire. So to see it on display, to see the beats repeated, just to remind you of who she is, uh, who she always will be. And uh, also where Kenobi will be, where he gets through all this. He goes through this challenge. He goes through this trial of water that you've uh, pointed out. <laughs> uh, and, and later on knows that that is not my fight. My part is something else. And I must complete that journey. And that journey is me standing before Vader in a different way, in a different spot. And it's Luke's now. And Luke, you're the one that must run, Luke, run to your uh, next uh, uh, fight, your fight for the future. I think it was real powerful, not just fun. It was powerful. Yeah, no, I, I really agree with that. I think that um, th- there's, I don't think that where Leia and Obi-Wan are at in A New Hope needs like explanation, uh, but right. that's the uh, benefit of being able to do this storytelling that you, obviously you can watch A New Hope without ever having seen this as people have been doing for over 40 years. <laughs> yes. And enjoy it and infer previous experiences. Uh, but if you love these characters and love this world, it is for me enriching to see uh, them, the building blocks of where they're at in A New Hope. I think uh, Obi-Wan has this like uh, familiarity and this understanding with Imperial ways, right? Mm -hmm. In A New Hope. And so to see him kind of confronting, he knows what it is, right? He gets it, but to see uh, these spaces that, kind of look like the machines of war that were built up for the Republic where, you know, he was a general, you know, as he even gets yeah. called in this episode yes, uh, yes. by Rogan. Uh, it had been, uh, maybe they were always a mistake because they were this, you know, militarism, this showing showing a, a fist to the galaxy. Maybe they're always a mistake, but they didn't feel like a mistake to, to Obi-Wan necessarily. They were just him doing his Jedi duty and trying to get through it quickly, but bonding with Anakin, bonding with the, the clones in spaces like this and but this is this dark tortured horrific version of it he's seen the stormtroopers up close to you know make opinions about them there is a confidence when he he gets to the death star of like yeah these imperials are all the same they they built another <laughs> uh, uh technological terror uh to steal vader's words for kenobi uh mm-hmm. and i i know my way around it i know how to navigate mm-hmm. around them to do what what needs to be done. Uh, You know, it it gives some weight to when he says that great philosophical line to Han, but it's also practical of like, you know, you you can't win, but there are alternatives to fighting, you know, Uh, of knowing that. Yeah. And, and I think probably emotionally even more powerful that Leia is getting to see up close how horrific the empire is. And that it seems like she's already strong, already knows, um, you know, intuitively uh, how to, resist uh yeah. the the attempts to invade her mind um it knows to go through these various tactics uh of trying to cope with this trauma but to go from where she was you know in episode ago not mm-hmm. truly understanding the depth of the horror the thing like mm-hmm. the empires it's our government it's meant to help people yeah. right like nope sorry band-aid ripped off this is the truth of it it's an important uh, point in her emotional journey and does set herself up to, to know what it is to be captured uh, by the Empire. To know the cost. Is it scary having to pretend? Uh, yes, it is, but I'm doing it to help others, right? This is a big lesson there. Remember, this starts, this episode one starts with her, her mean, dumb cousin saying, I hear they don't even let you off this planet, which you you know we take as, as truth at that point there. So uh, she's not only off, she's really seeing it, and I think that's going to inform her. Yes, she's going to, you know, the teen years are coming, the Leia Princess of Alderaan book, and she she uh, learned some valuable lessons of how to use her power, how to use her privilege to help others. But yeah, she 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 knows the score. And that's why, to me, it's a building block versus more than just, uh, oh, Leia's known, she knows she's been tracked before, so she's figured out, yeah, that's a little bit of it there, but it's, she just knows the lay of the land, knows the lay of the galaxy, and knows that I'm going to do more than just wave. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I also want to ask you about the tracker. Um, it it does seem to me that that is something that, that Reva obviously did, uh, mm-hmm. manipulated uh, Lola in some way, but it doesn't seem like that was her first choice. It didn't seem like she was trying to let <laughs> no. Obi-Wan and Leia escape. It seems like her first choice would have been to cut Kenobi's head off and mm-hmm. present the information from Leia 
uh, as a prize to Vader. Uh, maybe she didn't want to cut Obi-Wan's head off, uh, probably just a limb and leave the rest of it for, for Vader. <laughs> but it seems like she wanted to uh, continue her her pursuit and and have that victory and, and not have any possibility of fifth brother <laughs> yeah. calling her a failure or being choked by Vader, but that this was a backup plan that saved her. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Similar to then uh, Vader, right. In, in a new hope in the same sequence, I would imagine, uh, you know, he, 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 uh, he kills uh, Obi-Wan, but then is turning, he's cut off by that door and those stormtroopers aren't shooting to uh, scare. Right. So yeah, I think mm-hmm. it's, I think it's uh, smart. It's a backup plan or it's a, you know, you're looking at a situation th- at, at, from a 360 degree angle. And also, you know, uh, keep in line with even Palpatine. Sometimes your plans go awry. Take that uh, part of the uh, gone awry and turn it into your next uh, moment, <laughs> turn it into a strength. I think it's all I can track all of it there. Yeah, because at the end of the day, yeah, I'm going to put a saber through your uh, chest uh, if I can and, that, 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 and, and go from there. But yeah, no, I agree with you on that take that it wasn't necessarily her one goal. Yeah, yeah. I also think uh, kind of final thought on some of these uh, A New Hope vibes. There's something interesting in this, uh, you know, merging of where we're right in between the trilogies and the moves that Obi-Wan is doing, particularly when it does that tentative little twirl as he's getting back mm. into the rhythm of using his lightsaber, uh, that's very much prequel Kenobi, right? So it's yeah. interesting to see like prequel Kenobi sneaking around a, a space that has such Death Star vibes. It's just kind of yeah. aesthetically, visually bridging uh, the two trilogies. Totally, totally. Oh, love it. Uh, so moving on to just some little fun things. Uh, we got some good planet mentions. Uh we are told by Riva that the Empire intercepted a transmission about the existence of the path from Balnab. <laughs> mm-hmm. Balnab is from the Clone Wars episode Nomad Droids. That's where uh, some crash pit droids uh, are doing a Wizard of Oz game to rule over the native Hestons. Uh, it later appears in, I think, an Age of Rebellion Han Solo comic. And clearly there's some uh, built up parts of the the planet uh, more technologically advanced. But what a great uh, deep dive grab there. And then uh, less of a deep dive, uh, Re- uh, not Reva, but Tala's lie to Reva about where the path is based is Florum where good old Hondo used to hang his pirate hat. How did you feel about those? Our our Hondo watch continues. We're oh so (laughs) close. Oh so close. Loved it. What if if Obi-Wan was going down the line and Hondo was in there and in the tomb and (laughs) Obi-Wan was like, come on. Oh, come on. No. Yeah. No. Obviously. He'd be alive and you'd hear him just going like, I'm really under the water. Get me out. <laughs> hey, Get me out, Kenobi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know we've seen it before, but I'm always going to love it when we see code cylinders in active use. Yeah. Because before visual dictionaries, that was a fun conversation to have. That was a playground and a bar conversation. Like, what What are those things that everybody's got? <laughs> those little pill bottles, they keep their pills in there. What are those? Um so knowing that they're code cylinders and having them used as is ID is great. I think. Yeah, I, I want to say it is. It's weird to think. I, I've had, I had several conversations growing up where it was like, "What are those?" It's weird to think now. <laughs> where now we just have all those answers by the time the movies come out or the shows are out. Just wait a week or wait wait till Alex, Alex gets a video up or we talk about it. But yeah, uh, between like eighty three and ninety one, it was like, "What are those pens?" Weird times. Weird times. <laughs> yeah, is that is that? Do you only get those if you've been with the Empire for five years? Is that where those <laughs> come from? Yeah, and I think I'm fascinated with it because I think there's a a desire from Favreau and uh, perhaps Filoni as well to to really uh, have plenty of elbow room on the ongoing story of the the Mandoverse. But I also think from Favreau, who grew up with all that, where you only have so many films and you get to wonder about every little detail. I think that's part of the reason that th- there aren't. Uh, visual dictionaries yet because mm, i think yeah. that there's a desire to be like a bounty puck you, you yeah. kind of know what that is but there's plenty to ask go have fun talking about it <laughs> don't yeah. worry about it don't worry about it love yeah that. yeah but fun to see the code cylinders in use uh i loved this detail uh i haven't found anything confirming it um but when obi-wan is swimming into the fortress, uh, much like uh, Cal Kestis did, uh, there is this creature on the side of the door mm. that looks a lot like uh, a, a, a different, slightly different mouth in, in teeth construction. But other than that, it looks a lot like uh, uh, the Vixis uh, from the Umbara arc on Clone Wars. Mm. And you and I had done kind of a deep dive on 
Sarlacc and Sarlacc and Vixus and uh, one other creature all, all are uh, related to one another as uh, organic things that burrow into the ground and then mostly are just mouths and tentacles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but so it was kind of cool to 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 say like, hey, is that is that a kind of Vixus that that uh, grows uh, in the water? But I also just love that detail. This is the kind of thing that I always like in Star Wars to keep the the pulp flavor alive to just see like weird creatures off to the side, even if they're not mm-hmm. the focus. Um, and in particular, I love that the this is this technological terror that the Empire has stabbed into this water moon, uh, but they can't stop the organic from creeping in from this creature attaching itself to that yeah. and seeing all the various, you know, creatures outside and like, you can't, you can't control everything. Uh, anyway, what yeah. did you think about that? I, I love the whole setup. If Fortress Inquisitorius is, is, a, is a great addition to Star Wars and I'm with those stormtroopers, this place gives me the creeps. I, I want out of here. <laughs> you know, I, I have my underwater fears. I don't love, don't love going under. I don't like what's in the ocean. Fascinated, beautiful, wonderful. I don't want to be a part of it. And uh, drowning's not my favorite idea. And so to see those stormtroopers just floating there to see all the creatures, uh, man, uh, me still want to take a bongo and get on out of there. But it was a fascinating Star Wars uh, world building, as always. Those little details, like you said. Yeah, I love looking at what I am thinking of is the water vixus. I could definitely be wrong. I'm just calling it that. I love seeing it. I love thinking about it. Uh, the second I step into the ocean, I will fear stepping on one. So I totally, right. totally understand. And that's, you know, even a lake. Rock, rock, squishy. I'm out of there. I got to go back to the shore. <laughs> <laughs> agreed agreed it was fun to see uh the seeker droids and have them named uh by obi-wan uh, mm-hmm. appeared in phantom menace and uh seeker droid is a big helper in to Iden versio in the battlefront 2 campaign and therefore to the person playing the video game uh the only other thing i wrote down is the uh the where's leia of course having great rhythm with where's ray where's han where's padme uh any other canon uh moments that you wanted to discuss no i think that's Pretty much, I mean, that's yeah, bigger, bigger stuff. But yeah, it was uh, the whole thing was just a wonderful homage, but a, a, a powerful connection for me. So yeah, the biggest one was Terra So yeah, biggest one. And then yeah. of course, I think we uh, mentioned it at the top, but the entire thing is is really influenced by uh, the Fortress Inquisitorius level mm-hmm. on Jedi Fallen Order. Were were you affected by that? Uh, I mean, I know you are a fan of the story. Mm-hmm. of Fallen Order and a little mixed of rating on the actual gameplay. Yeah. Uh, did you find yourself feeling like uh, a friend of the show, Riley Silverman, tweeted the funny joke, oh, we just watched Obi-Wan play Fallen Order. Um, <laughs> and, and I think uh, I think maybe maybe a lot of people f- uh, felt that way. I know Alex Damon, huge yeah. lover of the games, thrilled by it. Were you affected by that? I've been there. I've done that. Or was there any element where it feels like I've seen this before because I've been in the video game. I've, you know, yeah. I've seen water <laughs> uh, crush bad guys in Fortress Inqu- Inquisitorius before. Yeah, I had this one thought. I might go replay that level. So, yeah, I think it worked. <laughs> I think it worked. I'll be frust- frustrated a little bit, but, uh, yeah, it worked. It was fun. It was, and and this um, era where we in, we're, we're, we're several years into this Disney era, and with new things introduced, it is fun to see it just all kind of put it on the same map, put on the same timeline, and 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 have prequel Kenobi interacting with modern video game with young Leia uh, acting out some parts from New Hope. It was it was really a fun mashup for me. It really was uh, fun. Yeah, and, and I uh, among the things that I really enjoyed on my first viewing of Rebels was that that line of uh, Mustafar is where. Jedi mm-hmm. go to die. And that was when I was early like, Ooh, okay. Rebels is kind of different, but it is really going to connect to everything. That's oh man. I'd love to see that. Let's see more of that. And that one line was really ringing out to me too. Uh, seeing uh, the tomb and the fortress completely. Yeah. All right. We are going to move on then to action. There was some good tension and some good release of tension with action in part four of Kenobi. What were some favorite moments for you, Ken? I start with uh, a, a, one of my favorite things to list kind of non-action is action. Uh, Tala's then I'm your commanding officer and you will dress me as sir was a, a big action. And in our house, it was described as sexy, not by me. Uh, so it was a powerful moment there for her just to kind of realize uh, that the the way people, like you talked about earlier, the way the Empire and the Imperials uh, react to domination. And now you can, mm-hmm. at least for a second, use it to your advantage. But I like that moment. 
Yeah, yeah, no, that that was a really, really great uh, interaction. Like that very much. Uh, if it can be called an action, uh, definitely a uh, uh, Obi Wan popping out of the boxy tank and seeing a boxy tank <laughs> it tucked away in a in a different little space was fun. <laughs> yes, look at all the places you can put a box. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I was thinking about that. Uh, it just it's like up on a little ledge in your downstairs uh, resistance basement. <laughs> exactly in your cave basement on Jabim. That's a great yeah. place to tuck your box tank. Uh, for the big true action moments, oh, there there were a ton, but yeah. um. Honestly, the lights going out and then the lightsaber igniting in the dark. That that was a huge one. You talked about it as a as a real uh, very a very purposeful hero ignition. Yeah. I loved the lightsaber, the the very first one we saw the lightsaber igniting mm-hmm. in the previous week's episode part 3. Yeah. Uh, but it was out of fear, absolutely. It was out of he might be right behind me right now. Um mm-hmm. and this was so much like this blade is <laughs> is to help, it's to to defend. Uh but I just kind of got chills as much as the lightsaber igniting, but as the lights going out, because that's so Kenobi, that's so sneaky, that's so I have a plan, right? Uh, if this was a Clone Wars episode, you know, Anakin would have force pushed the doors open and yelled, I'm going to yeah. get you to the stormtroopers, right? Yeah. Obi-Wan turns off the light and sneaks up. <laughs> Obi-Wan, turn out the dark. Uh, love that moment. Absolutely love it. Like I said, it, it, in terms of just... Uh, you know, him igniting it for the first time in a way, in a way it, it works for me. There's uh, you know, uh, last week was great from a different point of view. Um, and we always say, don't forget star Wars has to kind of look cool at times. And that was really cool. Yeah. And I mean, that's another thing that really did strike me about all of the action throughout this is in some ways it was something that we've seen a lot in, in other ways, something I've thought about seeing in terms of just the action thrill for a long time. Yeah. Uh, throughout the original trilogy, like the, the stormtroopers are they're the, the soldiers of the empire. And, uh, we never really see anyone take it to stormtroopers with the lightsaber. You mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. we see Luke fighting at Jabba's palace. Uh, you know, we see him fighting Vader. Um, he, my action figures, uh, certainly had Luke hitting stormtroopers with lightsabers. <laughs> Many, most video games I've played in my life, I've certainly hit stormtroopers with lightsabers, but it was kind of a hell of a thing to see like Obi-Wan Kenobi just straight up hitting a classic stormtrooper with a lightsaber was both like very familiar and also like, I've thought about this since I was a child and haven't yeah. truly seen it in live action. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I absolutely, uh, yeah, I'm going to, like, it's going to be a lunchtime watch again for me today. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, moving on, uh, there'll be some more Kenobi. But I really mm-hmm. did like uh, Tala's open palm head smack to the trooper. <laughs> the trooper's shaking their head. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I, the whole sequence, because, uh, like, I, the breaking free of the store troopers, because that, and then, like, doesn't she, like, reach under the helm of the other one and, like, pull it? Yep. <laughs> and she- it's just great. She knows the vulnerability of the helmet of like, okay, great. They have some strengths, but hey, just whap them into somebody's face and pulling on the chin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> some helmet vulnerabilities uh, that I'm sure she told the Ewoks. We'll find out. Um, joking. What were some other moments for you? Um, I, I want to go back to the uh, Kenobi's first bit, little bit of action other than uh, the back to tank. It just him just kind of aggressively just doing the choke. And then I said earlier, but I, I love this phrase, just dumping a trooper in the drink. It's just kind of, it's, it's so uncivilized without a doubt, but it's what's needed in the moment. It shows kind of where he is. Uh, I don't know. I, it was, uh, again, added to the whole video game sequence because I am a ignite my blade and hack everything. But sometimes you need to do the stealth mode, which is like R1 maybe or something. So I like the Kenobi approach from that point of view too oh yeah no the, the stealth was great followed by the sploosh and then you see in the background <laughs> yeah yeah the floating trooper it was great fun uh a lot of great moments for me just individual action moments in obi-wan's uh, uh escape um with leia I, I really liked the uh very uh direct smack in the bolt into the door controls yeah that was really a great moment uh there's a moment where he dodges a a trooper's blast and they hit the secret droid and take out (laughs) secret droid for Mm -hmm. obi-wan which was nice and then uh, of course of course that little tentative twirl that's getting back into the groove but not quite there that was uh my two cheer moments i i woke my wife perhaps with the uh, Terrace Nube, no, uh, but perhaps the yes for the twirl. <laughs> so that yeah. was a big moment for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, other thing that I kind of liked in that whole sequence is 
we did see some troopers take some damage, right? There's mm-hmm. Obi Wan had to hit a couple of them a, a couple times. Uh, one trooper did get hit by a bolt, but then uh, kept up, uh, stepped back up and kept fighting. Um, and I kind of this was a little bit of justice for stormtrooper armor. <laughs> Sometimes it does say. protect them. I was just, I, we know each other well. I was like, is, we've just started a new campaign. <laughs> it's not entirely useless. Uh, <laughs> was there anything in that, uh, those sequences of, of Kenobi's escape that spoke to you? Uh, I'll tell you what, I, it was a smaller moment, but it, it's the big action. And it's a lot of fun stuff with the Stormtroopers indeed. And a lot of it uh, begs rewatching. But uh, just the idea that the visual of, of Leia just um, uh, in red, just drenched in red mm. evil light, and, and, and Kenobi pulling her from the light uh, highlighted the the uh, the rescue for me. So I, the, that was the big action rescuing Leia. That was his, his <laughs> point to actually see it and see how it was uh, how it looked. Uh, really effective too. Yeah, yeah, and I, I love that Leia had the great situational awareness to be like Ben the window. <laughs> yeah, the window. <laughs> Yeah, it was a great moment. Uh, the Purge Troopers blaster sound was real cool, too. Oh, good I call. I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah, a little Death trooper vibe, a little, uh, we've heard that sound before in some of the things, but uh, yeah, I really love that. Love that. Yeah, it's got, it's it's like the space laser version of having a silencer or suppressor. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of a foot, foot, foot to it uh, rather <laughs> yeah. than a crack, crack, crack. You're right. I did feel like I was playing Goldeneye. Yes. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, I also, I, I debated whether I should keep this in action or comedy. There's the great heroic moment where the, uh, the not snow speeders show up mm-hmm. and then uh, Obi-Wan and uh, Leia and Tala are on the run and they're, they're blasting their way free. And Tala takes the time to specifically shoot a mouse droid. <laughs> Okay, that was not popular in our house, Joseph. That was not popular in our house. Okay, um, but like they're they're just couriers, right? Yeah. Uh, like, yep, yep. We're big fans of Indira Varma in our house and all her characters. She's very popular, but when she did that, Grace yelled out, "Not the mouse!" So that was not sexy, was it? No, not sexy. Well, not called sexy. Wait, in our house. What did you make of that? That choice was it? Was that random blaster fire, or did you feel like Tala was like and bleep you too, mouse droid? Oh yeah, no, I, I kind of first of all, it, it's in my mind it survived, right? It just kind of was like it got out of there. But I gotta think she's like those. I've tripped over those things. They've been in rooms when I thought I was alone all my time in the Imperial <laughs> uh, Armada. Here, they have driven me crazy. So I'm getting out of here. I'm taking one shot at a mouse droid. Yeah, I bet. Did she have nightmares about the little sounds they make? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and final thing, I, I did really like. Uh, I I will uh, listen and understand anybody else's uh, feelings about the uh, technological components, but man, I loved Riva sitting there blocking uh, speeder shots and then mm-hmm. throwing the canister. Right? It was the, yep. this is not going to stop anything. It's not the ship that he's in. It's just the petty vengeance and domination on her side, and then the other side, the the true pain of loss. This is the risk. Uh, of yeah. stepping up to help other people, but it was also just, it was a cool action moment of just using the force to throw that canister. It really was. And to be clear, uh, yeah. And, and I thought the canister was something uh, kind of cool in a way for Riva to do. Yeah, no, I, I really did like the whole sequence uh, in, in, on paper and even the result and her parts of it look good. Like if some of it from the trailer, yeah, I, I have no problem with the sequence overall. And I think that's just where I am now uh, versus uh, 2019 with Mando where some of that stuff would trip me up a little bit. And, and I get it. I really acknowledge it and I get it. Uh, but this is where we're at, and we're not sitting down in, in a movie theater right now. Maybe one day we will again, and I've had that conversation time and time again just in the last five days of people going, I, I like it. I just miss movies. I do, too. We can have both. Mm-hmm. We will one day have both. And um, even as, uh, as as giant budget of a show as Game of Thrones was, the first time Danny got on a dragon, I was like, yeah, you know, never ending story for me, but it didn't kind of, kind of work. But what was there worked. And I think that's a great example of it. I love that. Love that idea. Wade taking that, taking the chance, doing what's right, and her being pretty darn good at what she does. Yeah, and maybe even a little bit of that Wade, uh, you know, holding back. Like Sully yells at him, "It's okay, let's go." Right? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you know, is there a moment where Wade kind of crosses that line, where like, no, but I want to take one of them out? You know, I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, I, I love 
approaching storytelling is there's always going to be a, a reality behind the scenes, like in Game of Thrones, where the first season they just tell us about battles that happen. <laughs> yes, look, man. <laughs> there's not even there's not even a uh, we're not even going to pretend to show you this from a helicopter view, 800 miles away. Just eh, just so you know, there was a massive battle. <laughs> there was a massive battle. <laughs> we caught Jamie Lannister in it. Yeah, look, I grew up thinking my bike could fly because I was so convinced by ET. Then you watch it now, you're like, how could that have convinced me of anything? <laughs> Yeah, I often think about in Return of the Jedi, uh, even the special ed- editions, the executor crashing. Yes. Even as a kid, I was like, eh, that isn't, eh, it seems like that should be a bigger explosion. Like I always say, <laughs> Luke. Uh, so if so, I can live with that for years yeah, and years and years, I, I can live with other things. I get it. I get the complaint. And I made them several times during Amanda season one. I still occasionally, the volume doesn't always click with me. But at the same time, the Inquis- I want to shout out Fortress Inquisitorius, both down down below and on the, on the deck looking at the ocean, really worked for me. Really great. But look, this is a series that has one of the most emotional moments with Han and Lando in front of a painting. And you know it's a painting. <laughs> Like, it is what it is. It is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah. No, and I, I can watch this and go like, uh, what if this had been a movie? How would that have been different? I think it's a fun conversation. But then at a certain point for me with that conversation, then it is the lessons of Star Wars. Uh, well, uh, it's not. Mm-hmm. It's not. <laughs> so do you, do you want to focus on the past, focus on what could have been, or do you want to move on and enjoy what is? Yeah, and so many wonderful, talented people put their heart and soul into it there, and I don't separate myself from that. I, I, I don't. Th- that doesn't. I don't want that to excuse any sins and just always be like, hey, they gave it their try. But no, they put their heart and soul into it, and that was a wonderful sequence to write down on a, on a final draft document and to and to execute in any way, shape, and form. That's the last thing I'll say on it. It is what it is, and I like to like what was there, and uh, it's only going to get better. Only going to get yeah. better. I loved it. I love seeing a, a dark sider shoot back beams from a not snow speeder. What a dream come true. Uh, so with that, we will move on to moments of comedy in whimsy. Ken, what did you write down here? So I only wrote one thing down. I don't think that's accurate Ooh. to the episode. There was other funny things. The the whimsy, we always say whimsy is kind of the sweet uh, heartstring pulling moments. And, and that Leia moment goes beyond just whimsy for me to just be inspirational and, and, and so heartfelt. But um it's, she's, and she says it in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a broken way because she's struggling. She's in pain when she says it. But to me, the joke of the show is, is this a staring contest from Leia to, to Reba? <laughs> it's, that's, that's, that's my princess. That's my princess. That it really, really was. It is a great way to show, you know, I'm not going to be intimidated uh, by you. Mm-hmm. You know, that Leia is, is this a staring contest? I know you're, you're trying to, yeah, maybe Leia, I don't. I don't think Leia probably fully understands. I think she can feel it. You're trying to get into my mind and I'm not going to let you. Yeah. Um, she kind of knows what this is. I don't think she's been sat down and just have it described and trained for it, but she is using her strength uh, to push back and then using humor to mm-hmm. deflect it, you know? Uh, and you can see Leia doing that many, many other moments uh, throughout uh, her career but you can also see Leia as, uh, this is the person who taught Poe how to do that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when yeah, Kylo yeah. Ren's trying to get in his mind, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, it works Works on a lot of levels for me. Include, yeah, including yeah. A four, probably four skills, something like that. But yeah, again, go that line. Her resistance to the mind probe is considerable. Yeah, well, and, you know, everything we've ever known about these things, uh, that it is, uh, it, it's not always easy. It doesn't always work. It's not always something that a dark setter can do. Kylo seems particularly adept at it, too. Mm-hmm. Be able to rip it out of Poe's mind, and you know maybe Riva is not at that same uh, same level. Leia certainly has strength, uh, so yeah, I, I thought that was great. Um, really, really loved that funny joke, uh, powerful, painful scene, and funny joke. Yeah, uh, I also wrote down uh, when Roken calls Obi Wan General, he says, "General, I'm sorry, but that's not my problem." And uh, Kenobi says, "Well, I wish that were true." It's it's a heartfelt line. It's mm-hmm. a, a good line, but it's also just a little bit of that Obi-Wan snark <laughs> just yeah. smacking it back of like, well, it is, uh, yeah. but saying it in a, you know, well, that would have been great if it wasn't your problem, but it is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, it cracked me up and it, maybe a lot of it was just in the, in the great delivery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also mentioned the Reva's little hand grab of frustration after Leia says she needs to tell Bale first. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, not, yeah, not played as a joke, but I found it so funny. Just so funny that oh, you ain't gonna win, Dark Side. You ain't gonna win with this one. Yep, no, the, just that little like no, I. It, it's almost more frustration. Like Reva's like, I thought I had her right, and like yeah. oh, the the little rat pulled the rug out from under me, and uh, 
a scary line and a vicious line, but not without some element of humor of like the the real tears line was was effective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, you you mentioned it already, but man, I uh, when I watched this morning uh, with the headphones in and the subtitles on, <laughs> the the stormtrooper yeah. banter. Yeah. Oh, I loved this place gives me the creeps. Hopefully we won't be stationed here for long. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. Uh, and it's just one of those great flavor moments that, you know, we, we could talk about the depth of it, the tragedy of it, the complicity of it, that the stormtroopers are rank and file. Uh, but that the idea that, that when they get close to the creepy stuff, like, oh man, you know, hey, do you know my brother's on Scarif? He's a short <laughs> trooper. I was gonna and say- I'm in a, I'm in this haunted house. Yeah, yeah, um, we're in a tomb, and, and I hear they're opening up lateral transfers to Scarif. Uh, we're gonna, and, and they're going to some place <laughs> called Endor. It is like, a, it's like forest. There's just bears there. We're we're taking them over. <laughs> yeah, super funny, and I think uh, just it, it fills out the galaxy in lots of fun ways. Yeah. Uh, final thing for me, which made me go laugh, laugh, and go ooh at the same time. I love the the cut to Vader, right? Mm, that yeah, Reva's yeah. failed, and then it's just like this absolute in a good way to me sitcom jump cut to vader walking down the hall we see vader brood so many times right where people kind of uh you know look at vader and apologize and you wonder what's going on behind the mask and then the choking starts i love that this was failure and then his breath starts and then it's just him running down the hall it was totally like a sitcom moment where like a kid like breaks a vase and think do you think mom's going to be met? And then you jump cut to mom screaming, you know? Yep. Yep. <laughs> it totally had that vibe and, and it amused me, but then immediately went to uh, a rough uh, and horrible place as well. Yeah. I, you and I are in the same mind. Cause I, I was going to mention this as well. It's, it's a, it's a great cut. It's great at it. Uh, great effective. And then just the, 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 a little bit of a shaky cam point of view, almost like he's coming at you. And I've already seen some people tweet of like, this is what rage feels like or being on the end of rage. So it works, it works for Vader, but it also works. You know, we make, jokes over the years, but like, you know, going to Krennic and, and calling call, call uh, Krennic to Mustafar and it's a business meeting. V- Vader is just, uh, he's like, uh, you know, downtrodden middle management here. The Empire is an organization. It is a structure. Krennic wants to get closer to Palpatine. He wants his promotion. Moff Jer Gerard wants the respect. He just can't get the resources in, in, in his quest for power. He, all these things, it, it, time and time again, it shows up. So this was like a little bit of a business meeting. We had the performance review the week, week prior or so, right? With, with, mm-hmm. you tell me where you want to see, tell me where you see yourself in five years in the Inquisitor program, Riva. And now this, that it was a little bit of a, um, that's kind of the energy and I like it. So therefore it has some comedy to it, but it's not, you know, it's not an episode of the office. This isn't Michael Scott, but uh, I, I think it, it works. This is the empire and, 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 and you can't get ahead. And the only way you can get ahead is it's designed to be uh, take out the one in front of you domination yeah. power. And it's empty and it's a lie. And Vader's part of that. But it still really was a great follow up of like, I laid this out. Success equals promotion. Failure equals death. <laughs> Yep. And, you know, the shadow of Vader is over this episode, even that great line of like, you know, we saying is Vader there. Um, so mm-hmm. to see him get there just as a uh, beat too late, walking down the hall, pissed and in there for a little business review was very fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, was there anything, uh, any other moments of comedy or whimsy for you? No, no, that was the big final one for me. Uh, was there anything that you weren't sure about or didn't like that we haven't talked about? I think we hit all the things, uh, so much in it. And this was an episode, short as it was, um, it begs a rewatch. And it's it moves fast. It's got that serial adventure pulp vibe, uh, including weird creatures uh, under the water <laughs> the ocean. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I really think there's a reward for going back into it. So if you've just watched once and you're listening now, hey, take another dive for this episode. Uh, do it on your lunch break. It's short, quick, to the point, but packed with a lot of meaning. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Is there anything else that we haven't touched on that you wanted to? Uh, no, that's it. That's it. Got it all. Uh, the other thing, I almost put this in comedy and whimsy, but the other thing I wanted to be sure to remark upon twice, twice, Reva calls Kenobi an old man and let's stop for some math. (laughs) (laughs) He's 48. (laughs) Hey, careful (laughs) roundabout. (laughs) He's 48 in a galaxy where some beings just casually live to 200 right yeah, the, yeah. he's younger than grogu back off let's stop calling kenobi an old man yeah back off man 
back up. Have some respect, Reva. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have any predictions or hopes for the next episode or two, since that's the amount that's left? Man, that's crazy. I hope the next two are hour and a half. Let's get some Stranger Things season four run times here. Um, <laughs> look, I, uh, I, I, I think it's... Uh, I think it's a prediction and a hope, uh, much like last week. It's like Leia's captured and uh, and, and all that. Uh, Reva uh, comes to their door and, and and Vader trailing, and we've got these. We got we got a lot of what you're talking about. We got some stuff we want to get to with with Reva. Uh, um, I say want, not need, and we got some stuff we want to get to with Vader. And we're heading towards these confrontations. So I like this tracker thing. I, I like the idea. I, I like that the that the chase is on. Yeah, yeah, I'm very intrigued to see where the all of these uh, characters' arcs will sort of uh, combine and resolve and how much they will resolve for some of the characters. I think it was really intriguing to see in this episode Riva and Leia kind of paired off as antagonists mm-hmm. to one another the way Vader and Kenobi are. And, and I don't mean that in a combat sense. I don't think, yeah. you know, little Leia is going to physically fight, fight Riva. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. But I'm curious to see how much the relationship with Leia or anything that Leia might do or say is a part of, of Riva's arc and Mm -hmm. Riva's resolution. And I'm really also intrigued with Riva uh, about the options that I've heard fans talk about is death, which is certainly a possibility or um, redemption. Mm -hmm. And, And I do think in star Wars land, we have become, in my opinion, a little too fast and loose with the word redemption. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think, you know, there's a possibility of just making one good choice. You know, maybe she yeah. just lets something slide. Um, maybe this is one part of Reva's story and, and she stays in, in the Inquisitor pro- program. Maybe she runs. Um, I'm really curious because I think there's more on the table than just death or redemption. Uh, yeah, I, that's an excellent point. I think I find myself looking at those two categories uh, too easily, too. Um, and you're right. Yeah, redemption is powerful. Re- re- redemption is uh, part of the, the great Star Wars lesson. But not sure her story is done. We're not sure yet. We just don't know. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think we've gotten used to redemption because it is powerful and it is meaningful. And particularly in movies when you're we're telling stories um, uh, that have, have clear uh, – resolution Mm -hmm. i don't know if they're going this way i I don't know what the writers intend to do with reva yet but there is to me this interesting possibility of you know she is trying to rise up in the ranks right now and she's claiming loyalty to the empire but what if she just runs and we don't know the rest of her story what if she just says none of this is for me you know Mm -hmm. Mm uh so curious to see where that will go um I, i do like what is set up is logical is that the Empire is going to uh, come racing down onto Jabim and it sets Obi-Wan on this path that we talked about and I wondered about uh, at the beginning of whatever the inciting incident is, does he realize the path it's setting him on? And I like that it's like, uh, I don't know that I can even do this, but I'll I'll grab Leia from some bounty hunters. And, oh, that means I'm on the path to confront uh, Vader. And, oh, that means it's now I'm now set up, Obi-Wan, to be the defender not just of Leia, not just of myself, but of the path mm. of the spark of the Jedi, of all this connection, all this hope that, you know, I put them in danger. I will defend you while you escape. They even already brought up the idea of evacuation and if it was feasible or not. Yeah. So I love that this is kind of set up for Obi-Wan to basically defend the spark of the Jedi, possibly. Yeah, no, beautiful. Love that. Love that yeah, idea. final final uh, prediction or hope is is more really a question of Obi Wan is he is making choices and he is taking action, but he is mostly being reactive. And I'm very curious to see uh, when or if or how he chooses to face Vader, or if it is a matter of I am going to defend people and if Vader is going to keep coming to me and I will I will react, or if there is going to be a moment where he he could go but he chooses to face yeah. Vader, you know, or, or if all of his confrontations with Vader are instigated by Vader. Yeah. Mm, interesting point. Yeah. Especially with what, what we think he might, you know, this Obi-Wan wants out as, as you did idea. What does that drive him to do in the last two episodes? Yeah. I think that's what I'm really thinking about is I, I am hopeful of seeing Obi-Wan make an attempt to get through to Vader but I also want to let go of that expectation if a different story is being told. And so far, as we're heading into these final two episodes, we're continuing to keep Obi-Wan on the path of being 
uh, reactive and defensive in a, in a, in a good way. Uh, and I'm very curious to see if that shifts into making a choice, even if it is a choice being like Vader's here, I'm in a conflict. I could try to run away. I could try to hack him down or I can in this moment, see if there's any possibility of Anakin in there. Mm. I'm really intrigued uh, about when and if that moment will come. Yeah. Uh, final uh, question is always is what merch would you want based on these episodes? I think we have the same answer. Do we have the same answer? You, I suspect we do. Go for it. it. It's Haggard Kenobi in Imperial trench coat and cap. We we need that figure. <laughs> we, need uh, we have different figures, in fact. Yeah, I, oh. I think that definitely the uh, Haida Leia under a coat yeah. <laughs> two pack yeah. is absolutely necessary. We're for sure going to get, uh, uh, I've already bought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the uh, Black Series, Wandering Jedi, mm-hmm. and then the uh, Tibetan Station, the the blue shirt Black Series, right. exclusive for for Target, uh, it, from Target. Uh, but they're for sure going to make his great outfit now, which I, I love that his outfit progressed, that it did bring him closer mm-hmm. to uh, his, his traditional Jedi look. So I think that action figure is, is probably going to be popping up very soon to pre-order. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we definitely need... Hide and Leia under a jacket, but we also need Bakta Tank Kenobi. <laughs> uh, you get Kenobi in his underpants. Yes, yes, we do. <laughs> We've talked about that great uh, Mark Hamill in a diaper action figure. And now we can absolutely have a whole Bakta Tank series. Give me a three pack of Luke Skywalker, Boba Fett, and Kenobi all in their underwear. What a just beautiful opportunity. Ah. Uh. Yeah, this uh, look. I've already cleared space on my cork board. I moved all my three and three quarter Leia figures over one because I'm waiting for a little Leia. I'm waiting for the little oh, collection because I have one from every era uh, of Leia's life so far. So uh, looking forward to that. Oh, I think it is coming. Uh, and with that, Ken, do you want to let people know where they can find us? Hey, we are Force Center Podcast, uh, the Force Center Podcast feed. We're on Twitter at Force Center Pod. We're on Instagram and YouTube as well. Uh, subscribe on YouTube. We do our monthly live Q and A's, or you know, six weeks. We're working that out. Star Wars Celebration took a lot of energy out of us. We're don't worry. We'll see what we're going to do on this one. Um, and uh, you can uh, uh, find us on Facebook as well, Force Center Podcast. Uh, we have merch available at tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. You can get an audio book on us by going to audibletrial.com slash Force Center. We're available in a lot of different spots. Acast is our home, but you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and more. If you're on one of those spots that has a, a rate and review system, we really would appreciate it if you give us a rate, a rating or a review. It helps uh, people discover the show. And uh, last but not least, you can support us directly at patreon.com slash four center. A lot of new Patreon supporters in the last couple of weeks. Welcome aboard. From there, you get into our Discord server to discuss Star Wars with four center friends every day. You can follow me at Catnapsock or go to catnapsock.com for more information on other things I do. Joseph, where can they go for you? Yeah, you can find me on all the social media. Twitter, Instagram, TikTok is at Joseph Scrimshaw. I've been sharing uh, some of my action figures on TikTok and then sharing that uh, other places on old social media as well. So check that out if you're interested. All sorts of other information and adventures is on my website, josephscrimshaw.com. But for now, for myself, for Ken, and of course, for venerable Jedi Master Tara Sinube, this has been the Kenobi Report. Oh, 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 oh,